This week's Creeps cast is sponsored by Masterworks. Start building a diversified art portfolio at masterworks.art slash Mr. Creeps. Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing well. With things heating up out there, what's better than a few scary stories to give you the chills? Let's get into it as we drift further into Mr. Creeps' mind. Incident Report Redacted Hotel, Room 401, February 3rd, 2017 Written by Quack Nate Summary Redacted Hotel in Redacted, Washington has had reports of hauntings for well over four decades, specifically in Room 401. Most of these reports are no more than hearsay, some are backed up by photographic evidence, and some more recent ones have been captured on video. Many of these incidents were reported to hotel staff and logged. There have also been a number of missing person reports related to room 401, and even some hospitalizations. The ones most pertinent to this report will be listed below. Two weeks ago, a practically unknown YouTuber named Redacted, referred to as John going forward, posted a series of videos of him staying in the room over the course of a week. After the third day, the videos ended. Hotel staff reported that he never came down to check out at the end of his stay, and his belongings were still in the room when cleaning staff went to make it ready for the next guest. The police were contacted, at which point our organization was made aware of the incident, which will be detailed below. Hotel Reports 4-12-71 Guest reports knocking on the window. Ask for security to get them to stop. Guest is on the fourth floor in 401, and there is no balcony below their window. Security reported no one outside the hotel during their patrol. 61175 Guests complained their room doesn't have a slot for the new keycard that they were issued for room 401. All doors should have been upgraded earlier this year. Maintenance was sent to room 401 to check, and they found the door did in fact not have a slot for the new keycard system. A key was issued and the door will be upgraded after their stay. 61775 Guests complain that the room doesn't have a slot for the new keycard that they were issued for for room 401. Maintenance says the door was upgraded on the 15th, but upon the inspection, the old style keyhole was present, and guest was moved to another room. 61875 Maintenance reports when they went to upgrade the door of room 401, the old door was completely missing. A new door was installed. 62075 Guests reported that they did not have a door on the room 401. They were moved to another room and maintenance was called. Maintenance reports the door frame for 401 is too small for the new door. They will call the carpenter to remove the old frame and install a new one tomorrow. 621-75 Maintenance reports the carpenter found the door frame to be the same size as the one that he was installing. Maintenance checked in that the new door fit the old frame. New door was installed. 629-75 Janitorial reports the door for room 401 had been painted a different color than the rest of the doors on the floor. The keycard did work, however. 1179 Guests complained their door in room 401 was left wide open when they woke up in the morning. They have the only key other than janitorial, but janitorial doesn't service rooms overnight. Guest was offered a free night and dinner from the kitchen, and accepted with no further incident. 317.80 Guest in 403 complained about screaming in the room to the left, room 401. Front desk called 401 but no one answered, 
a concierge was sent up and confirmed that someone in the room, a man, was screaming for help. The only guest registered to the room was a woman, named Redacted. Security was called, but the door did not have a slot for the keycard, and none of the old keys worked. They did not receive a verbal response from the occupants of the room, other than the screaming. They were unable to force the door open, and the police were called. The screaming stopped as the police arrived on the floor. Police battered the door down to find the room completely empty. Even the furniture was gone. Name redacted did not show up to check out after his stay. 528-83 Guest in 401 has made several noise complaints about the room to the right, 403. Room 403 is unoccupied. We sent security to check the room, but they found no signs anyone had been inside since the previous guest. 7-11-89 Guest requested early checkout. Guest was visibly shaken and remarked that they were relieved to have found the lobby. Guest was told about the policy about paying for the remainder of their stay and said that that was fine. Management offered to waive the rest of the charges but asked for a reason for the early departure. The guest refused to talk about it, said that it was fine if they were charged, they just wanted to leave. Management waived the entire stay. 111092. A woman came down to the lobby looking very confused. She said that she was in room 401 and that her card wasn't working. The reservation for 401 was under a different guest name, and the key card she produced was for a different hotel. We asked for an ID and she produced a card that none of the staff had recognized. She left the lobby, returning an hour later in a hysterical state. She approached the front desk, asking for a room. She tried to pay with some kind of foreign currency and was turned away, at which point she broke down. She wouldn't respond to questions and was just covering her ears and crying. The police were called and she was escorted off the property. 914-95 Guest complained that the tub in room 401 was filling up and starting to overflow with black fluid. Maintenance was called but insisted 401 has a shower and no tub. When maintenance went to check the room, the guest said that they never made any such complaint. The shower was inspected and found to be in working order. 10 97 Guest complained that the cleaning crew keeps walking into the room despite the do not disturb placard being placed on their door. Checked with janitorial and they said that they hadn't been to the floor yet today. And they denied entering rooms with the placards up. The crew member's appearance in uniform as described by the guest didn't match up with any of our janitorial crew. Guest was offered a free night and dinner from the kitchen. 1225-99 A guest in room 401 ordered room service. When it was delivered, the server was shot through the door. Police were called and made contact with the guest. Hotel staff weren't privy to their conversation, but the officers seemed to become increasingly nervous as the situation went on. A shot was heard from inside the room and police went in. They found the guest dead with a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. The server was only superficially wounded, and we were told that he would make a full recovery very quickly. 1-1-2000 A loud explosion was heard from room 401. Walls, mirrors, and windows from the adjacent two rooms and the rooms above and below, and the room across the hall were cracked or shattered. When security opened the door to 401, they found the room completely intact. The guest said that he had been awake at the time the explosion had happened, but he hadn't heard anything. All affected guest stays were calmed. 4-15-2000 Guest complained that they could not find room 401. A concierge was sent to help them, but the door to the room was simply gone. Security took pictures of the wall where the door should have been, and the wallpaper pattern was different than that of the rest of the hotel. 416 2000. Maintenance reports that when they showed up outside of 401 with the carpenters, the door was back, as was the original wallpaper. 
A guest complained that when they entered the room 401, another guest was already in there. Management verified the room should have been unoccupied, but a concierge went up to the room and verified that it was empty. The guest remarked that they must have gone to the wrong room because the furniture was different. 228 2011 Guest from 401 did not come back down to check out and there was no answer on the room's phone. A concierge was sent up and upon opening the door, he found the guest frantically pacing the room. She screamed at him to stay back and then threw a desk chair through the window and jumped out. Security was dispatched to secure the scene, but no body was found outside, and the window for 401 was intact. Maintenance confirmed the window was destroyed inside the room, and will replace it tomorrow. The guest family was also contacted to retrieve her belongings from the room. 3-1-2011 Maintenance reports that when they entered room 401 to replace the window, they found it still intact. The previous guest belongings were gone, however. 2-16-2016 Guest from 401 requested early checkout just after 10 p.m. Would not say why, though she looked visibly shaken. Management comp the night. 10 12 2016. Guest in room 403 reports someone in the adjacent room 401 is calling their name quietly through the wall. 401 is currently unoccupied. Security entered 401 and verified that it was empty. Guest was moved to a different room and his stay was calmed. 125 2017 Guest in 401 did not show up to check out. Guest is not answering the room phone or the cell number that we have on file. A concierge was sent to his room and found his belongings but the guest was not present. We'll keep them in the room for the remainder of the day while we wait for the guest to return. 126 2017 Guest in room 401 did not return to check out as scheduled yesterday. His belongings are being moved to lost and found. The police are being contacted. Video evidence. Video recovered from a flash drive found in the room. Transcribed below. Video begins inside room 401. The camera is pointed down at the bed before swinging up rapidly and panning across the room. Across from the bed is a small set of drawers with a TV mounted on top. To the left of that in the corner is a desk with a lamp and what appears to be a guest laptop. The window on the back wall has the blinds and curtains closed, but no light is seeping through so it appears to be nighttime. The guest gets out of bed slowly and backs away from the front of the room as she pans the camera towards the door. A short hallway leads to the door, with the closet on the left and the open bathroom door on the right. The female guest is breathing erratically. Okay, no one is going to believe what I just saw. Something came out of the bathroom and ran back in. It was, it looked human like a woman, but kind of, I don't know. There is a sudden noise from the bathroom. It sounds halfway between a loud electrical discharge and human screaming. The guest's breathing quickens and becomes erratic, and her voice drops to a whisper. Oh, what the heck? The camera backs against the wall opposite the bathroom and slowly approaches the door. Jesus Christ, please don't let me die trying to film this. As she approaches the bathroom, the noise blasts out again a lot of this time. A sea green glow flashes out of the bathroom. What is that? As she slides sideways, pointing the camera through the bathroom door, there appears to be a woman clawing at the far wall beside the toilet. She is naked and her body is slightly transparent and glowing the same color as the flash of light. She arches backwards, clawing at her eyes and her back bending more than 90 degrees, leaving her face pointing directly at the camera. She opens her mouth and screams, producing the noise from earlier, only much louder this time. Holy crap! There's a burst of a sea green light as the noise peaks and then goes silent. The woman is gone. 
What the... Hello? The camera pans around the bathroom, but no sign of the woman can be found. Other than scratch marks on the wall behind the toilet, and some black fluid pooled on the floor outside of the shower. Man, screw this. And the video ends. YouTube Series A YouTuber named John uploaded a series of videos of him staying at the hotel for five nights. Only three out of the five nights were uploaded to his channel, and those were taken down at our organization's request. Video transcribed below. Redacted Hotel, Five Nights Day, Night 1. Uploaded January 20th, 2017. The video opens with a shot in the lobby of the hotel. The name on a large sign behind the front desk is blurred. John speaks. I can't believe we're actually here. Let's go. The video cuts to a quick intro, and then back to John in a hotel room. Hey, what's up guys? It's your boy. The video skips with another haunted destination. This time, I'll be staying at the historic Hotel in Washington. I've heard a lot about it, as have you if you've watched my video back in May last year. All kinds of weird stuff happens in room 401. Most of it is only passed around by word of mouth, but the hotel staff say that there is a logbook full of incidents from that room that are just too wild to read. Apparently management keeps the logbook locked down, and only a handful of longtime employees have had the chance to read the whole thing. But from what I've heard, a simple haunting doesn't even begin to explain some of the things that have happened here. Speaking of here, the camera pans around the room. This is it, the fabled room 401. Let me give you a quick tour. The camera pans back around the room. Well, so far it's mostly just a normal hotel room. The camera moves into the bathroom. Also, nothing extraordinary in here, but we have five days to try and see something wild. I brought enough food and water for the whole stay, so I'll be spending all of it in this room. The hotel Wi-Fi is good too, so I'll be able to upload daily from here as well. Alright everyone, I'm gonna get settled in and we'll pick back up in a bit. The video cuts to a shot mounted in the back corner opposite the computer desk. The computer desk, the TV and drawers in the bathroom hallway can be seen. It's a time-lapse shot of John setting up his computer and settling into the room. The video cuts off suddenly. The video picks up from the computer desk. The shot is centered around John's face. A camera shut off on me while I was setting up, but I'm not going to chalk that up to ghosts just yet. I'm going to go get some food and plan on picking this back up later in the evening. I'll keep it recording from the mount behind, just in case though. The video cuts to a shot from the back corner, opposite of the computer desk. The blinds and curtains appear to be open, as sunlight is flooding the room. A shadow crosses the room as if somebody is walking by the window. John looks up as it is clearing the window and gas. John rushes to the camera, picks it up and aims it out the window. Nothing is there. What was that? The shot replays in slow motion. The shadow is clearly the silhouette of a person. John talks over the clap. This shadow was clearly human shaped, but what you didn't see was the form moving by the window. I only saw it for a split second myself, but it just looked like somebody walking by. By the time that I got the camera there, it was long gone. The video cuts back to the computer desk centered on John's face. Okay. Strong start, I can't explain what we just saw. There's nothing, I mean luck. He picks up the camera and shows the area outside of the window. It's a sheer four-story drop to a parking lot below. There's nowhere for anyone to be walking. He puts the camera back on the desk. Alright, I'll get back to my sandwich and see what else happens. The video cuts to a time lapse from the back corner, opposite of the computer desk. Nothing happens, but it keeps going until sunset. Time lapse stops and the camera starts recording normally as John walks over to the camera. Alright, I guess I'll try to get some shut-eye. If nothing else happens, I'll see you in the next video.
The time lapse continues as he gets ready for bed, and disappears into the bathroom for a bit and then goes to sleep. Before long, some kind of orange light starts flashing through the window, causing the time lapse to stop and the recording speed to go back to normal. John doesn't wake up. Despite the flashes getting more and more intense and a deep humming noise accompany them, the lights get incredibly bright, and soon every flash fills the room with a blinding white light. A final flash that keeps the camera completely washed out for a few seconds. As it goes out, a figure can be seen standing over John's bed for a brief moment, before the video fades completely to black. As the image fades back in, the figure can no longer be seen, but the door to his room is now wide open. A time lapse begins again and continues through the night without further incident. The video cuts to the computer desk. Whoa man, did you see that? What was this? It cuts to a quick, still image of the figure standing beside his bed. It's basically a silhouette and no features can be seen. It looks like an adult male. And what was all that flashing? I asked the front desk about it and no one else reported anything. Security also didn't see anything weird outside last night. It's getting good, folks. I'm going to do a quick edit job and get this posted so we can start up fresh on day two. See you there, guys. Peace out. There's a quick outro and the video ends. Redacted Hotel, Five Nights Stay, Night 2. Uploaded January 21st, 2017. The video begins in the parking lot outside of the hotel. The camera is pointed up towards the fourth story. John's hand comes into frame from behind the camera pointing at a window. Okay, that's my window right there. Now look at this. The camera pans around the sky. It's a sunny day with no clouds. Y'all aren't gonna believe this. There is sped up footage of him making his way through the hotel and back to his room. As he enters the room, the footage returns to normal speed. So, you guys just saw me come back in here with no cuts. And, he approaches the window and throws open the curtains. Outside, there is an extremely powerful thunderstorm raging. No sound from it can be heard, however. This is just amazing. The footage cuts to a quick intro, and then back to the parking lot. John is talking into a camera while he appears to be mounting it inside of his car. What's up everybody, it's your boy, and it's day two in Redacted Hotel. Okay, so I had a crazy idea, and hopefully this doesn't just end with me having my backup camera stolen. But I'm going to mount this one up in the car and have it focused on my room from outside. See if we can pick up anything weird. Let's see, um, uh, there we go. He makes a few adjustments and sets the zoom so the window to his room takes up most of the frame. I don't want to accidentally film someone else's room all night. He closes the back hatch and his room can still be seen perfectly through the back window of the car. Great, nice. Wait, what the... There appears to be a man walking around in his room. Uh... The video cuts to the other camera mounted in his hotel room. Opposite the computer desk, John enters the room quickly. Hello? He looks around the room briefly. Well, alright, all my stuff is still here. He moves to the window and looks down towards his car. I wonder if I'm focused on the wrong room. The video cuts to John, talking into the camera at the computer desk. Alright, so this is a bit freaky. I verify that I have the camera in the car aimed at the correct window, but this camera doesn't pick up anyone in the room. So again, weird stuff going on. Now I'm going to eat some lunch and we'll see if the spooky stuff picks up again. The video cuts to nighttime. The camera is mounted in the back corner opposite the computer desk. Well, a great start today, but otherwise pretty uneventful. Guess I'm going to head to bed and we'll pick up too. What are you doing in my room? He turns around and as he does, his body shifts, revealing a woman standing in the hallway. She's only wearing a towel and appears to have just showered. What? You're... This is my room, are you? I'm calling the cops. Get out. She runs back into the bathroom, slamming the door. Hey, um, wow, um, all right, 
Hey, he moves towards the bathroom door. I'm going to go down to the lobby, okay? I'm just going to wait down there. If you need clothes or anything, just take whatever you need from the dresser under the TV. Okay? There's no response. Alright, sorry. I'm not trying to scare you. I'll be in the lobby. Oh, hold on. Let me turn off the camera first. He moves quickly towards the camera, but jerks back around when a sound halfway between a scream and an electrical discharge comes from the bathroom. Hey, are you okay? As he moves back towards the door, the sound happens again, louder this time. Um, okay, I'm coming in. As he opens the door, the sound blasts out so loud that it distorts the mic and the camera from across the room. A bright flash of a sea green light washes out the screen for a moment, as John reels back and covers his face. He drops back against the closet door and sits for a moment, rubbing his eyes. What the heck? Hello? Are you okay? He stands up shakily and leans into the bathroom. Holy crap. The video cuts to a shot of the bathroom. There's a large puddle of black fluid on the ground. I don't even know where to begin with what just happened. I just hope that she's alright. I'm, uh, I think I'm done recording for the night. Yeah, see you guys tomorrow, I guess. The video ends. No outro was shown. Redacted Hotel, Five Nights Day, Night 3. Uploaded January 22nd, 2017. The video begins filming from the computer desk. John is facing the camera. John yawns. Uh, good morning, guys. It's your boy. And it's day three here at the Redacted Hotel, and honestly, I hope it's a slow one. Last night was pretty brutal, and as you probably saw... I don't, I'm still processing it, so I'm not going to say much right now, just gonna start with breakfast and see how it goes. He raises a steaming coffee cup to the camera and it cuts to a quick intro, and then a time lapse of the room from the back corner opposite the computer desk. He moves around the room watching TV, working on the computer, laying in bed, etc. The video drops to normal speed and he enters then quickly exits the bathroom. Huh? He walks over to the camera and picks it up, and then returns to the bathroom. So this is weird. The camera pans across the bathroom, nothing looking out of place. I didn't touch that black stuff that was on the floor. It was pretty thick and I even had to step around it this morning, but now it's gone. Not a trace of it left. The camera is lowered close to the floor but there's no evidence that any black fluid remains, even on close inspection. Uh, maybe it was, um, I'll probably never know. He sets the camera back on the stand in the back corner and the time lapse continues. It runs until nighttime with no incidents. The video cuts to the computer desk with John facing the camera. Alright, nothing too weird in day three. Sorry for the lackluster upload, but I kind of needed the day, if we're being honest. I'm gonna wrap it up for now. I'll leave the time lapse running overnight, and if anything happens, I'll add it to tomorrow's video. See you there. Peace. There's a quick outro and the video ends. Additional footage. John's belongings recovered from the room included his camera. On it was a drive with several hours of recorded video from after his final video. The raw video footage is transcribed below. Video starts panning around the room, settling on the curtains. It's very dark and no light is seeping in through the curtains, making it appear to be nighttime. What the heck? According to my phone, it's like 7.30. The sun should still be up. Anyway, some noise from outside woke me up. It must be storming or something. He gets out of bed slowly and turns on the lamp, and then he heads to the window. As he draws the curtains... Another set of curtains on the other side of the window can be seen. What in the... He moves the camera close to the window, trying to film through the small gap in the curtains on the other side of the glass. Is that a reflection? Wait a minute. The gap appears at pitch black at first, but the image starts to fade in and it appears to be another room, identical to 401 but mirrored. The gap appears at pitch black at first. But the image starts to fade in and it appears to be another room, 
identical to 401 but mirrored. No way it can't be. I'd see the camera, what the heck, how is there another? The lamp in the other room flicks on and the camera jerks back from the window. Oh crap. John quickly turns off his lamp and then moves behind the bed. He peeks the camera up to watch the window. The curtains on the other side are drawn and a backlit man appears into room 401. What the heck? The man cups his hands against the window and then looks through them trying to get a better look into room 401. He pushes away from the window, scratches his head, walks over to the nightstand and begins making a phone call. This is so weird. As the man stands up with the phone, John's phone rings. No, no way. The man turns his back on the window and John quickly crawls over the bed, picks up the receiver and ducks back behind the bed. Hello? What? Oh, hi. To the camera, it's whispered. It's the front desk. He speaks back into the phone with his normal voice. A noise complaint, what? No, no one is screaming in here, no. No, listen. John holds the receiver over his head. And just as he does, an incredibly loud and human scream rings out from the other side of the window. John drops the phone. Oh, crap. The camera peeks over the bed to the opposite side of the window splattered with blood. Oh, uh... The man's arm slaps up against the window, smearing blood as it slides back down. Uh, I, uh... There's a lot of impact against the window. Whatever struck it couldn't be seen through the blood, but a huge, clawed hand could be seen for an instant slamming into the window. <laughs> nope. John stands up and runs for the door. When he opens it, he finds himself looking into another room. Opposite him, a large creature slams a giant clawed hand into the window, shattering it. It's very tall, taller than the room, and it's hunched over. Blood is covering most surfaces, and the creature cranks its neck around to lock eyes on a John. John seems to be frozen in place until the creature roars. The scream is the same one from a moment ago, but not much louder and distorted in the camera's mic. John whips around, only to see the creature on the opposite side of the window, cranking its head back towards him. It roars again and crashes its way through the window, destroying everything in the room as it slams and tears its way towards John. John turns again and runs through the doorway, finding himself in the hallway. Come on, come on, come on. The camera pans left and right quickly. Both directions seem to go on forever. Another roar rings out and John just runs to the right. What the heck is happening? As he runs, the camera picks up room numbers from a few doors. They all say 401. Behind him, there is the sound of a door being broken open violently and another roar. John turns as he runs and another creature has entered the hallway. No, please. As he continues to run, a door to his right explodes open. Another creature squeezes its way through the ruined frame as John hugs the left wall, moving around it as quickly as possible. Get back! As he continues to run, you can start to hear his breathing becoming labored. More doors are heard breaking open and more roars are heard. It sounds like there's an army of creatures right behind him. Suddenly, John traps. No! The camera spills out of John's hand and lands upside down. The shot settling on at the elevator lobby. What the? What? John is heard scrambling at the camera. He picks it up and points it at his face, checking the lens and then he sweeps it around. The hallway has returned to normal. No doors appear to be damaged and no one else is in the hallway. What the? Alright, screw this. And the footage ends. Raw video file too. The footage begins in the hotel lobby. Mom, guys, this isn't the redacted hotel lobby. The architecture and furniture is drastically different from the lobby in his original video. This is so weird. A man in a gray suit walks up to John. Whoa, is that a camera? What kind of camera is that? Just a cheap Sony Handycam, nothing fancy. 
but like, where does the cassette go? It's so small. As they talk, the camera pans to the front desk. A woman in a staff uniform walks out of a room behind it. Cassette, why would you... Hold on, sorry. John makes his way over to the front desk. He drops the camera as he talks to the woman, so... It just records the floor in John's feet as they talk. Hey, um, this might sound weird, but where, uh, where are we? Oh, um, what? Could you... What do you mean by where? I mean, okay, what city are we in? What state? Oh, God, please let this happen on my shift. What state do you think we're in? Uh, Virginia? Oh, crap. Uh, sir, would you mind having a seat over there by the staff door? What? Why? Where am I? I'm really not supposed to. Look, I I'm getting the manager. She can help you out. Just wait over there, please. All right. John walks over towards the chair the woman pointed him towards and stops to talk to the man from earlier. Hey, sorry about that. I'm having a weird day. Hey, no worries. Anything I can do for you? Uh, could you tell me what city and state we're in? The lady at the front desk was being weird about it. Oh, yeah, you look pretty rough. Must be recovering from a hell of a party. Yeah, we're in Springston, Elizabethia. Um, what country is that? What? Obviously, Gwe. Everyone stop talking. The camera snaps over to a group of men in black suits entering the hotel. One of them looks over the front desk where the woman points to John. Sir, please put down the camera and stop recording. I, uh, gotta go, says John. John turns and runs to the elevators. One of them opens as he runs up and an elderly man walks out. He rushes past the man into the elevator and starts pressing the 4 button over and over. The camera pans around the button panel as he does so. Why is there no closed door button on here? Sir, stop. The men in black suits emerge from around the corner in a full sprint. John starts mashing the four button frantically. Please, please, come on. The door closes seconds before the men get to the elevator. John frantically almost whispering, What the heck is happening? The doors eventually open on floor four, and John rushes out of the elevator and runs towards his room. What am I doing? He gets to door 401 but pauses. Of course the door is different. He inserts his key but the light in the card slot flashes red. Come on. He tries again. Red again. Please. He tries again and another red flash. A ding is heard from the elevator lobby down the hallway. Come on. He tries again. Red flash. The camera pans back to see men in black suits entering the hallway. One points at John and they start running towards him. Please, come on. He jams the card in and out of the slot over and over, prompting a red flash every time. The camera pans back and the men in black suits are halfway to him. The lead man is reaching into his jacket for something as he runs. Please. Suddenly, the light flashes green. John throws open the door and rushes in, slamming it shut behind him. Oh God, oh God, what did I do? John can be heard hyperventilating as the camera scans the room. It appears to be his room. All of his stuff is in place and nothing is broken. What? John turned towards the door. Where did they go? They should probably be trying to knock this door down by now. The camera is pressed into the door as John looks through the people. No way. John opens the door cautiously. The hallway is a different color than the one he was just running down. He enters the hallway and it is empty. Okay, I have to get the heck out of here. There's a loud roar from his room. The camera snaps back towards it, only to see a massive clawed hand reach out and slam into John. Muffled screaming can be heard as John is violently dragged back into his room. Everything is blurry as the camera is jerked around, cracking the lens. A few wet crunching sounds are heard, and then another roar, and then the camera drops to the floor. The camera settles on its side facing the window. It and its frame from the floor to the ceiling is completely smashed, and beyond is only darkness. 
There's a sniffing sound and the footage goes to static, as a loud thud is heard before the footage ends suddenly. Despite the camera appearing to be destroyed, it was found with the rest of John's belongings in good condition. The room was also not destroyed, despite the footage as shown in the video. After the video was submitted to research, our organization permanently reserved the entire fourth floor. Guests are still allowed to stay on the floor to keep up appearances, but all stays are strictly monitored, and rooms 401 to 408 are no longer available to the public. I would like to extend a large thank you to this week's Creepscast sponsor, Masterworks. Masterworks is an innovative new platform that allows anyone to invest in blue chip artworks without the barrier to entry of being a millionaire. I'm always on the lookout for new ways to diversify my portfolio, and Masterworks may be one of the coolest new ways of investing. So, how does it work? First, Masterworks finds the best artists by analyzing around 7,000 artist markets. Then they purchase the best art and securitize the artworks which allows anyone to invest. So far, they have more than 100 offerings ready to invest in. Finally, Masterworks members can potentially make a proceed by holding the painting and waiting for the sale by Masterworks, or selling shares on the secondary market at any time, providing liquidity. One of the most exciting things in my mind is that art is an asset that has had almost no correlation to other asset classes. This means that it can go up in value even when the market dips, and it doesn't mirror the performance of other types of investments. Some notable artists on the platform currently are Banksy, Picasso, Warhol, Monet, and Basquiat, some of the best of the best. Start building a diversified art portfolio at masterworks.art slash mrcreeps. Again, that's masterworks.art slash mrcreeps. See important Regulation A disclosures at masterworks.io slash cd. One of my students was acting very strange. Now I really wish that I didn't look into her. Written by The Nightler. If you picked her brain enough, you would find that she's incredibly bright. And it's sad. That's what everyone says about her. I don't get it. Maybe I hadn't personally tested her enough to ascertain that for myself. But as per my experience, she was rather shy and didn't speak out much. As for her assessments, she had proven to be a tough nut to crack. Sometimes she would write a pretty decent exam, but hand me a poor assignment. I suppose some students preferred certain types of assessments over the others, but she never seemed to want to improve on anything. I had rung her parents when she had failed one weekend, but they came off as detached and uncaring. When she swung back to school the following week, she never brought it up or asked for help or constructive criticism. Nothing. She just faded into the back of the room like usual, and I wasn't the only one who had an issue. Anne, her history teacher, and probably my best friend in the school, had observed the same too. Though she had a more positive view of the kid than I did, all in all she got below to average marks and never participated in class much, and now that I think about it, I didn't see her around the cafeteria or anywhere at lunch either. It was like it was her personal mission to remain as invisible to the school as she possibly could. That's what I initially thought, anyway. Okay, so I should back up a little here. For clarification's sake, I'm a teacher and I've been at it for around 7 years, but I've been teaching at this particular secondary school for almost 3 years now. Macy, the kid that I've been going on about is in my year 11 legal studies class. As I said, she never had a lot to show for it, but we had just come out of a two-week end-of-term holiday. She was back to school and suddenly, it was like a switch had flipped in her head. She strolled into the classroom that morning, all warm and bubbly, 
Hey, Mr. Decker, how was your holiday? There were a few things wrong here. Not only had she come to class on time, which was a rarity, but never in the history of ever had she spoken to me like that. At the time, it didn't seem like it was anything worth the complaint. I mean, as a teacher, you'd be crazy not to welcome a change like this. As the term went on, her attitude shift only got better. She did well on assignments, participated more, and even asked me for help. It was good to see a positive change from Macy. Until it wasn't anymore. Eventually, she started becoming more, how do I put it, irritating. Every little sentence that I said was picked apart and corrected by her. And the worst part was that she was right every time. Google seemed to side with her every time, but I had studied it in uni. I had a degree, and she's still in frickin' high school. She basically teaches my class for me now, and I'm just totally and completely lost. I don't know what she did to make herself this incredulously knowledgeable in law, but in less than two months, she went from a meek, unassuming kid who didn't perform well academically, to a well-spoken, disgustingly intelligent, academic with the knowledge of a professor at Harvard. It was straight impossible. A feat like that takes years of work. Now, I talked to some of the other teachers who taught her classes and a big shocker. Most of them were having the same issue too. Just what is it with that kid? It's like she got replaced by a clone or something. There's no logical or rational explanation for such a phenomenon. Yesterday afternoon, I sat her down to talk. Inside me, I wanted so badly to rip into her and call her out on her behavior. But the logical part of my brain knew that it would only devolve into another debate. And why would an idiot like me pick fights with a genius like her? No, more than anything, I just wanted to know what got into her head. What was her home life like? What made her suddenly want to study so much and most importantly, how is she studying so much? I remember everything she said as clear as day. I would pull her aside during class while her peers were typing up their assignments. All of them had eyes glued to their screens and headphones in, so I was sure the conversation was private. So, what is it that you would like, Mr. Decker? She asked innocently. Listen, I began. I applaud your recent academic progress and you've greatly improved over the course of just a term. It's hard not to be proud of that, huh? She giggled bashfully. Yeah, it's nothing really. I had it in me the whole time, who knew? Now I wasn't playing around anymore. Yeah, well, to be completely honest with you, I don't know how it's possible. She seemed taken aback. Sorry, you don't know how what's possible. Well, all of this progress. You have the knowledge and skill of a university professor. You couldn't have just done that overnight. Quite frankly, I'm a bit worried. She gave me a chilling, blank stare accompanied by a soft, unnerving smile. What do you like to do for fun, sir? What? You heard me. What do you like to do for fun? Um, oh, Maisie, I'm not entirely sure what this has to do with. Answer the dang question. Her face completely shifted in a second to one of disregard and irritation. It felt almost sociopathic. I knew that I should have chided her for her tone and language but the disturbingly eerie feeling she gave off urged me to answer the question. I had a neurotic, anxious pit in my gut that told me something really, really bad would happen if I didn't humor her. Um, I like to hike, I, I like to read, I play sports, I skateboard sometimes. What are you trying to get at here? Oh, nothing, just curious is all. Your pretty cool hobbies must be an interesting life that you lead. You know, I like to play video games, give the old guitar a good strumming, and sometimes I draw. That's been my life since I was a child. I don't do much, you see. My heart raised to my chest. 
I had zero clue where she was going with this, but then she continued. So I guess is, all I'm trying to say here is that I've had no idea why you're so worried about me. I'm doing fine. I don't know what it was about her answer that terrified me, but I promptly dismissed her back to her seat. For the rest of the day, I couldn't stop thinking about that conversation. Everything about it felt so inconceivably off. I hate to say it, but it made me lose sleep. I barely got a wink last night. I was furiously trying to piece it together in my head. It's like nothing about her made sense to me anymore. I came back home from work about three hours ago. Today, I was on a mission to try and collect as much information as I could. I didn't teach my year 11 legal studies class today, so I didn't see her at all. Good. I had to be crafty about it, but in my spare time, I found all their records throughout her time here. I learned who her teachers were and what they all said about her in the reports. I even found out that she used to frequent one of these schools, a psychologist too. It was odd to me that a lot of the names I encountered in these documents, I didn't recognize. I reckon about half of the names listed I knew. Some of the teachers I did know, however, had left the school. Reading through all the reports made me feel like a massive creep, but I felt more than justified in doing so. I recorded all of it, taking various photos on my phone, writing down names and important details. All I could think about while I was doing this was that something seemed rather odd to me about them. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. When I got home, I immediately got to work cross-referencing her report cards with each other. Here's what I found so far. She seemed to have had a pattern of this behavior. Every teacher who had a negative view of her or gave her bad marks at the beginning of the year would drastically shift opinions by the end of the year. She would go from failing those classes to getting straight A's. I recognized very few of these teachers. If she had already been doing good at the beginning of the year, her marks wouldn't change, and neither did the opinions of the teachers who had marked her assessment. I recognized a lot of these teachers, although some of them didn't stick around. Interestingly, Loa, she had deviated from this pattern in grade 7 when she initially started high school. What was also of note in her grade 7 reports was that both of her parents had changed their numbers. Strange. I banged my hands against the keyboard. Nothing. Just more questions. A thunderstorm of whys and hows that pierced my mind. My head lowered into my hands and I found everything that could mean something. But this couldn't be the end. I needed answers and I had to find more. My eyes lingered on the names of former teachers. And then I thought about something I really shouldn't have thought about. Whatever happened to those people? I tentatively searched their names on Google and began clicking on as many profiles that looked like it would lead to something. Of the 19 names I didn't recognize, I found about 7 matches. Their Facebook pages listed them as high school teachers, which to me was a dead giveaway. As for the rest of them, I found nothing concrete. There was one thing all 7 profiles had in common though. They were old. All of them were currently inactive, with most of them seemingly untouched for years. A horrible feeling brewed in my gut. I felt like I was about to uncover something I really, really didn't want to know. I scrolled through the old posts of one Frederick Blank, and I saw what had to have been a relative of some sort commenting on one of them. I had the regrettable idea of clicking on their profile, and it didn't long for me to see a repost of something truly awful. Frederick Blank had died three years ago. After more digging, I found that this was also true for four other profiles. Amy Friend died one year ago. Alex Guthrie died four years ago. Bailey Van Zandt died one year ago. 
and Hans Ulrich died 10 months ago. My heart was thumping out of my chest. None of this could have been a coincidence. These deaths were all connected to something, I was sure of it. I spent hours digging around, trying to find obituaries, news articles, anything that mentioned the deaths of teachers in or around my city. I ended up finding out the grim fates of three other teachers from the 19. I found out most of what the police or media had to say was inconclusive, which meant that most of these deaths were under mysterious circumstances. This already did not bode well with me, but what pushed me over the edge was a photo that I found of the supposed crime scene of one of the murders. I saw one detail that looked off to me. I squinted it making out what I figured to be a ghostly figure hidden in the background. And then I saw it. A bright, familiar smile. Macy's smile. I snapped my laptop shut, catching my breath. I must have been seeing things. This whole stupid research project was driving me insane. I dragged myself to the kitchen and got the kettle boiling, but the uneasiness never left me. I had the urge to tell somebody, anybody about my findings. I know that it probably sounds stupid, but I wanted somebody to know this in case something bad happens. After returning to my desk, I almost instinctively grabbed my phone from the desk, unlocking it. A photo of Maisie's Year 7 records greeted me. I realized that this is what I was looking at last. I was about to close out of it until I saw the old phone number for Macy's dad. I don't know what possessed me, but I dialed the number. Uh, there's no point, I told myself. The number is just going to be dead. But then it picked up. Surprised, I muttered an almost instinctual, Hello? Into the phone. What was this? A gruff, harsh voice responded. Uh, I sat there lost, scrambling for something to say. My, my name is Mr. Decker and I'm calling about Macy. He took a long, breathy pause. Is this some kind of sick prank? He spat. Uh, no, I said, taken aback. Uh, I'm her legal studies teacher. I don't give a crap about who you are, buddy. You're freaking sick. Wait, wait, I pleaded. I think there's some misunderstanding here. Who exactly am I speaking to? If you know about Macy, I'm sure you know who I am, stalker. The real question is, who the heck are you? Ed, uh, my name is Ed, Ed Decker. I teach at West Halford. Your daughter's in my law class. I swear that I'm legit. Complete deafening silence. Macy's been dead for five years. I take late night drives. The things that I've seen are unnatural. Written by Tally Tal 13. I've always suffered with insomnia. Even from a young age like 9 or 12, it has always plagued me. I usually just stay up doing meditative things until I fall asleep. That's before I got my car and my driver's license. Now I just take long drives to rural parts of my county, where the woods and the farmland are. No one is ever out on the road, so it's very peaceful. With that being said, it doesn't mean that I'm alone on those dirt roads. The things that I've seen have both horrified and intrigued me. I'll share a few experiences that I've had on these stretches of a lonely road. The figure. During one of my late night drives, I went further than I usually do. The road gets older and more overgrown in those parts. It basically leads to a very ancient forest with nothing but tire marks as a road. I'm driving and all of a sudden, I catch something in my headlights. A tall humanoid figure covered up by the bushes. 
facing a tree with its arms by its side. Kind of Blair Witch style. Now I've seen stuff like this before, so I just take a mental note of it and I continue on exploring. For context, the things you encounter out here at night aren't necessarily hostile. They won't mess with you if you don't mess with them. I didn't see that particular figure for the rest of the night, and I didn't get a good look at them because of the bushes covering them. All I knew at the time is that they were really tall. I'm talking making basketball players look scrawny. Other than its freakish height, the proportions were all out of whack. One shoulder was huge and beefy, but had a twig-like arm attached to it. And the other shoulder was thin, but had a bodybuilder arm at the end of it. That night was pretty uneventful, so I decided to head back early and try to sleep. The next night was much more interesting. As per usual, I couldn't fall asleep, so I hopped in my car and drove to the rural dirt roads. I decided to head back into those deep woods to see if I could see that weird, tall figure once again. I'm driving slowly down this forest for about 30 minutes, radio off dead silent woods, and I don't see a thing, which is pretty uncommon not to see something weird. I closed my eyes inside, running my fingers through my hair. When I opened them, the figure was there, misshapen body, arms at its sides, facing the opposite direction. It was directly in front of my headlights, and I got a better look at it. This thing was wearing a filthy dark green trench coat, with some torn brown jeans and boots splattered with mud. The figure's legs were also misshapen and uneven. One leg was swollen and was as thick as a car tire, while the other leg was literally just skin and bones. The hair on the back of its head, a waxy patch, and it looked like a failed buzz cut. It stretched out its skinny arm, like it was getting ready to point at something to the side. The figure's hands made of finger scissors that opened and closed. I sat there, completely in shock. My heart sank with the realization. It was mocking me. A while back in school, I got bullied by this guy who called me Snip Snap and would constantly make the same motion with his fingers. He called me this because, well, I'm a trans girl. I grunted in anger and gestured for this thing to move to the side. Its back was facing me, so it didn't see. I had serious thoughts of running this thing over, but I remembered, if I don't mess with them, they won't harm me. I just drove around it and I didn't dare look in the rearview mirror to see its face. It was facing backwards for a reason. I still see it from time to time, and it always is mocking me with gestures, mimicking something painful from my past sign language to mock my sibling who went deaf from an infection, waving a fist around violently to reference my ex, the gesture of holding a cigarette to make fun of my aunt who had lung cancer, etc. This thing really just upsets me more than anything. Its mutated body is kind of unnerving though. The Eater now the eater is a pretty common one to see on those roads at night. My first encounter with it was just like all the other times that I see this thing. It's semi-humanoid, with pitch black skin and a very obese frame. It walks on all fours like a gorilla. It has a tiny claws for hands. Its face is like a leech with dead and glazed over eyes on the sides of its neck, and the gross thing has a long tongue. I'll see it early on in my drives. The eater is usually crouched over a body of an animal with a chunk of the meat in its tiny hands. 
The eater just licks at the meat with that huge tongue that it has. It just laps up all that's left over of the animal. I don't think it hunts. It's more of a scavenger. The eater is very docile and gets kind of curious when I pass by. It doesn't get too close though. Sometimes I'll throw some leftover dinner that I have into the tall grasses for it. I still wouldn't touch it if you even paid me. Live and let live is what I've learned in these places. Skinless. Skinless is one of the more dangerous things out in those woods. Whenever I see her, I immediately turn around and go straight home. She's a skinless woman, hence the name, and a white dress soaked in blood. Her body is always bleeding, and she has a large butcher's knife clenched in her hand. She appears in the tall grass and will stumble towards your car slowly. She's slow, but she'll catch up eventually. Skinless will stand by your driver's side window and tap her knife against the glass. She'll ask you if she's beautiful in a voice that echoes through your soul. It sounds like a much more demonic voice is speaking under hers. If you lock eyes with Skinless, you'll have the uncontrollable urge to gag or throw up. If you do throw up or gag, she will violently smash your window and try to flay your skin. I've only ever had this happen once, and I managed to speed off before she could shatter the window. She kept screaming about how she would skin me alive. If you do basically anything, she'll kill you. I haven't really bothered to try saying yes because it's nearly impossible with the crippling fear and that sick feeling that you get inside your stomach. Your best option is to just drive away before she catches up. Once you get out of those grasses and back to civilization, you're pretty much fine. I may write about my first encounter with a skinless in a separate post. If you see her in the distance, just turn around and don't look back. Last but not least, Headlights. This is by far the most dangerous creature that I've encountered on my drives. If you see this thing, you better go as fast as you can in the other direction and pray to every single god and deity that you know. I almost stopped going on drives after I met this thing. Last month, I was on a drive that was eerily calm. There was nothing, no wind, no rustling, not even any strange apparitions. I thought that it was strange and I slowed down slightly while driving, my eyes darting off to every corner of the tall grass and the forest. There was absolutely nothing. Skinless usually scares off some other entities and animals, but she only appears once every couple of weeks. This was different. This continued until I reached an old farm at the edge of the tall grass. I usually pull to a crawl and I look at the barn. Sometimes there are shadows or a strange ram-like creature that'll walk by the windows. Nothing walked by the windows. Strangely, the absence of any horrible monster was making me afraid. And that's when I saw it. Two huge headlights stabbing my eyes like two suns. I could hear the rumbling, the sputter of a damaged engine. In front of me was a 1940s style truck, painted completely black. A sense of impending death fell over me like a macabre blanket. And I quickly fumbled with the stick shift to throw my car into reverse. I nearly floored it as a scream erupted from inside of the truck. The scream was not of this world. It ripped all the joy that I had in my heart out and into the starless night. 
whatever was driving that thing, it was pure evil. It was an ancient force of malice, like the boogeyman or the devil. The truck engine growled as it peeled after me while I was in reverse. I didn't have the time to turn around, or else it would have cut me off and crashed into me. Eventually, I reached a clearing where I could turn around by putting all my weight into turning the steering wheel. I zoomed down the forgotten stretches of road with the truck in hot pursuit. My radio came to life with a piercing roar of static, and it played an audio that it still haunts me to this day. A woman, she was screaming in pure fear, a deep, primal howl of pure dread. In the background of her screams was that old Here Comes the Boogeyman song. A masculine voice could also be heard, mumbling as there was a slicing sound, and the woman's screams somehow got louder. I peered into the rear view again to see another horrible thing. Two huge pale arms that were six feet long, coming out from beneath the black truck. The hands were balled into fists, and they tried to slam on my rear window, but I quickly swerved out of the way, almost hitting the tree. These pale arms coming from the truck galloped along the ground, helping it pick up and gain speed. I soared out of the old roads and pulled onto a modern street and slammed the brakes at a gas station. As I caught my breath and refueled from that horrifying experience, I noticed that my radio, it was spewing a choppy static that sounded like a dying moan. Yeah, since then, I haven't been out driving for a while after. I'm thinking I'm going to start taking a different route. If you do find yourself there, remember to chuck some meat in the field. Look out for skinless and don't even think about heading to that barn. I work for a secret facility performing monstrous experiments. It needs to be stopped. Written by Avatar of Horror. I need you to know what is going on at the facility that I work at. I need to confess the things that I've done there. I work for a company called Genomix Therapies and the experiments that they are conducting, that I've helped with, are monstrous and need to be stopped at all costs. My work as a lab technician and I can with no bit of arrogance say I'm a good one and I was asked to join a project at a remote company research facility in northern Canada. What little I was told initially was that a new medical treatment was being pioneered there and that it was so revolutionary that they needed to keep it hidden away from competitors. Though spending several months in a lab in the freezing north was hardly my idea of a good time, I was guaranteed that it would lead to a higher role and there was a bonus in store including stock in what was sure to be the biggest medical treatment in the world. After several flights and a bumpy landing, I arrived in a field of snow. The wind cut through me when I exited the plane, and I saw a series of concrete prefab buildings. The small plane crew hurried to unload supplies and gestured for me to enter the largest of the structures. Inside the space was warm and well lit, and a thin man in what I guessed was his mid-fifties stood with his hand extended while I closed the door behind me. Welcome, I'm Dr. Klein. We're so glad to have you join us up here. He grabbed my hand to shake and usher me in. The brutalist concrete outside belied a surprisingly homey feel with an open space of couches and desks, leading up to a second floor balcony overlooking the area below. I took off my jacket as Dr. Klein led me forward. 
Most of your colleagues are working, but let me introduce you to Dr. Brenner, our head biologist. A portly and gruff man stood up and nodded to me. Head biologist, animal handler, and whatever else a genomic seems to need. Glenn and Dr. Klein who pretended not to notice the barb. You'll be working with him as his technician, so I'll leave you to the introductions. Brenner, when you're done, we need to get started on the next round of testing later this afternoon. Please bring our new guest along as well. Dr. Klein nodded and headed off into another building. Brenner turned to me, looking me up and down before grunting. Well, welcome to the worst place on earth. Come on, follow me. He turned and lumbered towards a door and punched in a code waving me to come along. We entered a tunnel and after a few silent minutes, we exited out into a cacophony of animal sounds. Cages of dogs, pigs and monkeys yelped and wailed as Brenner pointed to a work table in the center of the room. Look around as this will be home for you. We do the live specimen testing here and they're sending us samples faster than we can perform the experiments. What exactly are we testing? I jumped a bit as a large dog barked at me, examining the room and equipment. Mo, oh, it's a new medicine from a frankly unknown source. Apparently the head biologist isn't privy to such information, as Brenner made mocking air quotes. But I will say what we've tested so far has shown us a great results. He motioned for me to join him near a cage with a pig. This specimen, like all the others here, is terminal. Dang thing had more tumors than actual organs, but after treatments, it's like a newborn, completely cancer-free. I marveled over the clipboard with testing data. This can't be accurate. A full recovery in such a short amount of time. Oh, it is, and if it wasn't for the recent accident, I would say that it was a miracle. I cocked my head. What accident? And Brenner's eyes went wide. I've said too much. He cleared his throat loudly, changing the subject. Get the next round of testing set up for specimens 1743 and 6503 going. Lots of work to be done. Letting the comment go, I looked back at the incredible data sheet and wondered just what unknown substance could create such results. I put the clipboard back in the cage and looked down at the pig. It had a healthy vibrancy that would have won a blue ribbon in another context, but there was something off about its eyes. There was a movement in them, something unnatural, something behind them. You gonna get moving? Brenner barked. Uh, yes, sir. As I walked away, still staring at the otherwise docile pig. The next few weeks flew by as time got a bit lost working in the concrete lab structure. The other scientists and technicians were all pleasant enough though with different shifts and areas of work so there wasn't much interaction. I had heard from a bunkmate that I was a replacement and the last person had gone nuts. I tried to press Dr. Brenner the day after. So, are you going to tell me what happened to my predecessor? The portly man sighed. I knew the dang gossip mill would get to you eventually. Well, suffice it to say, he went crazy. And what does that mean? Brenner threw his clipboard down on the table and gestured for me to take a seat. There was an accident. A trip and fall and some of the testing samples got injected to him at a higher dose than we've ever given to any specimen here. I wanted to emergency evac him, but Dr. Klein overruled me, claiming the weather was too rough, but I know he just wanted to see what would happen. And what did happen? Brenner took a deep breath. Initially, at first, nothing. We monitored him, and like the animals here, he seemed to respond well. Slowly, everything from his cholesterol to an old scar began to get better. I think Dr. Klein was getting himself fitted for a suit for a Nobel acceptance ceremony. But as much as he physically got better, he seemed to mentally decline. At first, he would just start spacing out, staring off into the distance that the rest of us couldn't see. They then began not to sleep, not to eat. He reacted negatively any time anyone tried to get close to him, even becoming violent at one point. The poor lad would be found raving loudly that it was coming, that it was calling to him. 
I swallowed hard. And what is it? Heck if I know. One night he had broken out of his room and was found in the materials lab doing something. When caught there, there was some sort of struggle and he ran out into the cold. He ran out into the snow. Yeah, like I said, he went crazy. We went and looked for him, only to find his frozen body prostrating himself towards the sky. It was a sight I don't wish to relive. There was a long, awkward pause in the room. Just what are we working with here, Dr. Brenner? I don't know. It's either something that could be the next miracle medicine, or something to ruin us all. Come on, more work to do. After the conversation with Dr. Brenner, I tried to find out as much as I could about the mystery substance that we were working with. Most of the coworkers commented how they didn't know either, and only had a vague guess as to its true nature or origin. What I couldn't understand was, there was so much turnover in a remote facility like this. The gossipy bunkmate from before it already apparently left the site, and a replacement was coming. After hearing about my predecessor, these strange amounts of personnel changes, and watching the test animals act strange, I had to know more. Now I'm no spy, but I figured I could try to find some information in Dr. Klein's office. So I watched the posted shift schedules and took an expected bathroom emergency when he was to be away. I tried to nonchalantly make my way towards his office, and I lucked out that there was no one around. Looking around to double check that the coast was clear, I made my way into the room and shut the door quietly behind me. I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't a smoking gun exposing everything right away, as the office looked mundane, and like the rest here at the site. I walked to his desk to see papers scattered around, progress reports to Genomics HQ, weather forecasts, personnel files. Everything seemed to be expected to find on a project leader's desk. What caught my eye, though, were numerous geology reports in areas far from where we were located. Around the world, different locations had been marked for digging, excavation, and other kinds of exploration. I wondered if the substance that we were working with had to be gathered from somewhere deep below the ground. My attention was then caught by reports around the moon. A topography map and geological samples recovered from back in the Apollo missions were heaped in a folder titled Project Athea. Before I could dive further, there was a PA announcement calling for Dr. Klein. The hallways were end to end, so I knew that he would have to walk back this way. I tripped over myself, trying to get to the door, and I cursed myself for my clumsiness. Pushing myself back up, I exited the door just in time to see Dr. Klein walking towards me. I tried to turn and walk like I belonged until I heard him call to me. Are you okay? You're scheduled to be in the lab today. Uh, yes sir, I just needed to stretch my legs. I said, trying not to sound panicky as I turned to face him. Dr. Klein stopped and looked me up and down for a few moments before nodding. Well, best get back to it then. I'm needed as well. I was about to breathe a sigh of relief when Dr. Klein looked at his office door. It was the slightest bit ajar. He looked at the door and then at me as I tried to walk away. With a loud thud, he closed the door. I suppose I should walk you back to the lab. I'm heading that way anyway. Oh, that's not necessary, sir. Oh, I insist, please. He gestured for me to lead, broaching no argument. We walked in silence, making our way through the common area. You feeling alright? Uh, yes sir, just needed a quick walk. No, I meant more generally. How are you feeling? You haven't had any incidents or exposures, have you? No sir, nothing like that. Well good. We here at Genomix value safety above all else. He stopped, putting his hand on my shoulder. We also value the work we do here, which can only happen if we work as a team. That means following directions. You can do that, can't you? Of course, sir, I don't. Good, good. I would hate to have to replace another of Dr. Brenner's assistants so far into our work. 
Before I could respond, he gestured to the hallway leading to my lab. Thank you for this chat. It was most enlightening. Dr. Klein watched me as I walked away from him, and once I was out of sight, the tension enveloped me and I collapsed. I barely slept the next two days. I tried to process what I had seen in Dr. Klein's office. The geological maps, the information on the moon. What did it all have to do with the substance that we were testing here? As I made my way to the lab, I heard a series of loud cries and growls and I rushed forward. Inside, all the animals were wailing and howling. Monkeys scratched at their cages while dogs barked and howled. The pig from earlier though was bashing itself again and again against these sides of the cage. I made my way to Dr. Brenner's side as he was trying to sedate the raging animal. What the heck is going on here? I don't know, just help me get the tranquilizer through the gate. He yelled over the cacophony of animals. The pig was smashing itself, causing blood to stream from its face. The blood though was black and oily. I helped load the tranquilizer and helped steady the injection, as Dr. Brenner put it in through the thick hide. The doe should have stopped the animal cold but it just kept smashing itself again and again. Soon, black blood sprayed on me from the impact, which nearly caused me to retch from the smell. As the hinges of the cage buckled under the assault, a loud bang echoed from behind me, and the sounds of animals in the room had ceased. I looked over to see Brenner holding a pistol still pointed at the cage, his hand shaking. I stared at the dead pig. Black eye core oozed out of the bullet wound. A good minute passed before Brenner lowered his arm. What happened here? Dr. Klein yelled, running into the room. I don't know. I came in to do the testing and the specimen had gone berserk. Klein ran to the shot specimen and anger flared. You shot the specimen in the freaking head, you idiot. We can't even get a good autopsy of the thing now. The shock of the situation had seemed to wear off on Brenner. Listen, you self-righteous idiot. That thing was about to break loose and I'd be danged to let another experiment go wild here. The two men stared at each other before Klein threw his hands up. Get that specimen autopsied now. And he stormed out of the room. Brenner gritted his teeth as his portly frame shook. Get a biohazard suit and let's get this dang thing examined. After suiting up, we moved the pig to an examination table. I was glad to have a breathing apparatus as the smell had become intolerable. As we examined the deceased creature, the insides were incredible. As the testing had shown, there were no traces of tumors or really any other visible maladies. The viscera was a mix of normal blood and a thick, viscous black liquid. I pulled a sample and I placed it under the microscope. After I did, I shot back from the instrument in shock. Dr. Brenner, please come look at this. What did you find? This black stuff, it's still moving. What do you mean, move aside? Brenner adjusted the scope several times before looking up and back at me. Listen to me very, very carefully. Forget that you saw this. What do you mean? Brenner came over and put his hand on my shoulder. Whatever this substance is that we're testing, this is the exact same result that killed your predecessor. Forget about what you saw, and I'll take this to Dr. Klein. Sir, I don't understand. But Brenner had already begun tearing off his hazmat protection and storming out of the room. The next day, I was called into Dr. Klein's office, my mind still racing for the previous day's events. The movie in Black Blood kept me up all night. I sat across from Klein, who watched me stone-faced. I want to apologize about what you experienced yesterday. Dr. Brenner had lost control of the situation, and you were forced to help clean up his mess. I don't believe that's what happened, sir. As Klein held up a hand towards me, well, there's no need to defend him. Brenner has been removed from this project. Removed? Why? Klein sat back in his chair. He lacked the commitment to meet the goals that we're trying to accomplish here. Sir, where is Dr. Brenner? I would like to speak with him. Well, that would be impossible. 
who was sent home on a plane this morning. So soon, but I... The Klein got up from his chair and walked over to me, leaning on the side of his desk. I need you to take over his work. But sir, I don't have the skills or experience. Perhaps, but you've seen what has been going on with the testing. We are close, so close, to making the world's greatest breakthrough here. I don't think that I'm up for this, sir. I replied as Klein stared at me before and nodding to himself. Before you decide, please come with me. And he gestured for me to follow him. And we walked down the hallways through the complex before arriving at a door labeled Materials Lab. Klein swiped a keycard as the door slid open. Walking inside, I saw stacks of orange hazardous material boxes. But what caught my eye was an object encased in glass on a table. Klein walked over and gestured to what was inside. It appeared to be a rock, jet black and jagged. I walked around it a few times before looking back at Klein. Is this the material that we're working with? Klein nodded and he smiled ear to ear looking at the piece. What do you see? I see a dark rock. I'm not a geologist, sir. No, but you are a biologist. What matters is what's inside this rock. Klein then motioned towards vials of black liquid behind him. This rock contains biological matter older than the earth itself. I stood mouth agape at the statement. I don't understand. How could a rock be older than earth? Did you know that the moon did not form with the earth naturally? Billions of years ago, the planetoid that was earth orbited the sun alone. But a cosmic visitor, a rogue planet, entered the solar system and collided with the earth. The result of the cataclysm was the combination of the two spheres and the material that would become the moon. What you see here is original matter of that rogue planet, extracted from the deepest part of the earth, as well as samples from the moon. I don't even know how to process this, sir, but what does it have to do with biology then? Klein turned to me. He gave me a look of what I can only describe as hunger. The rogue planet was at least partially biological in nature. This... this is alien. In a cosmic sense, yes. But it is also part of the Earth and the Moon too. We believe from geological scans and surveys, the majority of the Moon is made up of the remnants of the rogue planet. I believe this is why civilization since the dawn of man have worshipped the Moon. It's not just because it is there watching us every night. No, it's because the moon is a part of the original celestial visitor to our planet. We are connected to it, bound to it. He turned back to the rock on the table. This material is a gift to be used. You've seen yourself how it heals and mends the bodies of everything that it touches. Imagine no more disease, no more plagues or degenerative conditions. This could turn all of humanity into gods. I was caught up in the amazement and wonder. I had seen the testing data and I had seen the results firsthand. The treatment did seem to cure everything. But then I recoiled. I recalled the pig going mad. It's bashing against the cage. The black blood pouring from its head splattering me. But it drives these subjects mad. I know about what happened to my predecessor. Klein stopped smiling as he walked over putting his hands on my shoulders. This is why you are needed here, to refine the treatment, to work out how to deliver the good aspects of it from the bad. Please, you've experienced so much already, it would be a waste to have to send you home as well. In the next few months, I was consumed with work. Though I barely ate or slept, I felt energized with purpose, never having felt better. I had reached a stalling point in the data on animal subjects. There seemed to be a point, no matter the mixing, the dosage or counter-agents that the animals eventually would go berserk. Sometimes it was shorter, other times longer, but all eventually tried to break free from the restraints. My mind was frazzled in frustration, when one night all the test animals with injections began to strain at their cages. Their howls echoed through the lab, and I looked outside to see a full moon in the sky. 
Some neurological connection in the brain finally realized the relationship. Without asking anyone, I opened the lab bay door and let one of the dogs who received an injection go free. The icy cold arctic air should have cut through me, but I instead felt invigorated and followed the released beast. It howled wildly into the snowy night as I chased behind it. Why I did this I couldn't tell you but it all felt right. The two of us ran in the hard packed snow for longer than either should have been able to until the dog had stopped. As it did, it looked to the full moon in the dark sky and it howled. This was not a canine howl though. It was guttural, primal, and I felt it inside me. I looked up at the moon as if it called to me. I could see it clearer than I ever had before. The craters and dead seas of lava were just cosmetic on the skin. What was below the surface was dormant but alive. While entranced in the moon, I could hear chewing, tearing, and I turned to see the dog ripping apart a carcass. The beast ripped and teared at the flesh and it took me more than a moment to realize what it was eating was a human. A body was frozen and the dog was devouring it. As I came to my senses, I screamed and shoved the dog away, who ran deeper into the snowy field. Looking down at the frozen body, even recently mangled, was identifiable. It was portly and a look of anger and fear encased the final moments of Dr. Brenner. But it was not just Brenner's body. In the snow were dozens, maybe hundreds of other human remains. I bent down and saw the face of the gossipy bunkmate from when I had first arrived, frozen in rigor mortis. I saw her and others' faces staring at me in the cold night, and I blacked out. The next thing I remember, I woke up in the hospital facility at the complex. I sat upright, pulling the various monitors off my skin as alarms blared at my rejection. A nurse walked in trying to call me, to implore me to lay back down, but I shoved her aside. Still trailing the wires, I barged into Dr. Klein's office, who seemed unimpressed with my entry, slowly glancing up. I see you're awake then. I walked over and slammed the files and computer off his desk. What did you do to Dr. Brenner? Why did I find him frozen out there? What were all those bodies out there? Klein sighed as I towered over him. Me like the fortitude to go on with the project, and that's all. Once he told me that you had been exposed, I knew that we had to monitor you, but he refused. He lacked the vision to see what was possible, what you could become. And what have I become then? One of many, hopefully. I don't know if you realized it or not yet, but you survived sub-zero temperatures in just your lab gear. You are proof that our work here is successful. It's just a shame so many had to come before you. What do you mean? My fists were now grinding into the desk. Dr. Brenner never told you. You were not his second assistant. No, you were the twelfth. My mind raced at the information. You... you were intentionally exposing me here. Well, not just you, no. Everyone here has been exposed in some way. This isolated facility lets the experiments play out as necessary and the results are monitored or recorded. Some get injections, other aerosol. Some just receive exposure by being around it or handling it raw. But rejoice, you seem to have lasted the longest so far. I grabbed a client by the collar of his shirt and dragged him forward. You son of a... You used us as lab rats. For someone who experiments on animals, that's a bit high and mighty, don't you think? To create the ultimate medicine that could save the entire species, I would sacrifice a million lives to save billions. The look in Klein's eye was one of pride, not fear, and I threw him against the wall. You're insane. Klein stood up, trying to collect himself. All those with grand vision are told as such, but what matters is that we succeed. You are now the most successful test subject. You've not succumbed to the madness. Please help me continue this grand work by letting me study you, for the good of all humankind. Something inside me broke as the next thing I knew, I looked down to see my hand wrapped around Dr. Klein's throat. Red poured over my fingers as I squeezed his neck, ripping into him. 
The wide eyes of shock on Klein's face. It was the last memory of him living before tossing him aside. I stood in his office alone for what felt like forever, staring at his body before eventually sitting down at his computer. I right now was sitting here at his desk, Klein's body next to me, to tell you all that has happened, hoping someone out there will read this and help stop this evil. Know that despite everything I've stated here, I am of sound mind and know how all this sounds, but please, please believe me, don't let Genomix cover this up. I go now to destroy the materials lab, but that does not appear to be the end of this even if I succeed. No, what I felt that night in the snow staring at the moon was hunger. It was a wild calling to the stars that something is awakening. It is there and it calls out. I know this because a part of it is inside of me, and what it feels is what I feel and what I feel is the need to devour all before me. The Real Outcome of Nuclear War Written by Pelicius. Walking through what had been a city up until mere hours ago, I looked through the faceplate of my suit and I gazed upon the destruction. Thinking of the immense energy the nuclear weapon must have had to release to sweep the city away. A few buildings remained in the far distance but so far nothing had showed up on our thermal sensors, which flickered and even broke occasionally, the radiation wreaking havoc on them. The ground shuddered as a few of our drones flew over us, getting ready to bomb the next target, which lay 20 miles ahead of us. My detachment's job was to clear unexploded ordnance that the nuke had blown up, and to deal with any survivors that we found. I gripped my Tesla rifle, uneasy at the thought of killing someone who hadn't done me any harm. But before I could think any further, the ground rumbled again, and an APC stained with soot and ash pulled up alongside us. Anything yet? asked the driver. He looked ill at ease. Soldiers like us couldn't remain on the front lines for too long before the bleak landscape and constant radiation started to get to us. As I watched, he gazed over the destruction inside, evidently saddened by the complete lack of life. I shook my head and he allowed us to continue ahead. We were always at the front making sure that everything was safe for the armor and the soldiers following that. As we trudged along, through the ashes and the perpetual twilight caused by the debris thrown into the atmosphere, by the countless nuclear weapons that we had detonated, a voice suddenly sounded in each of our earpieces. It was a friendly, feminine voice much like the one that would have guided people through the steps of withdrawing money from an ATM in the pre-war years. Attention, a nuclear weapon is about to be detonated. Please shut off all electronics and wait until the blast wave has passed. Thank you. I quickly turned off my thermal seeker, my earpiece, and my Tesla rifle, aware of everyone else doing the same. Engines from the APCs, the tanks, and trucks quickly shut off as well. If they were left on, the electromagnetic pulse from the nuclear weapon, being dropped 20 miles ahead of us, would short-circuit them and hold up the column. As everything went silent, we looked ahead, to where the next bomb was being dropped. There is no real way to describe the explosion of a nuclear weapon. In the early days of the war, when there was still sunlight, the smoke and ashes had appeared gray and brown. But now, more and more frequently, the mushroom clouds were going up pitch black, with lightning lancing throughout the cloud, as unstable atoms and molecules split and released little flashes of energy. This was exactly what happened as the bomb went off 20 miles ahead of us, 
blasting another patch of earth into oblivion. The cloud was huge, seeming to touch the very topmost part of the atmosphere, as a hot wind that I could feel through my suit swept over us, knocking a few people over. I leaned against an APC, watching the little flashes emanate from inside of the cloud. The sheer thrill of seeing a bomb go off never gets old, especially if you can appreciate the huge amount of destructive energy that it puts out, quite literally disintegrating entire cities full of people. Although most of the people were now either dead or fleeing desperately to stay ahead of eyes. The cloud stayed in the sky, blotting out even more light than usual as the radioactive particles rained down on us, bouncing off of our suits and filters. As I watched, ash started to fall as well. It was dark gray and fell slowly like snow. So as we walked even further into the city, drifts of the stuff began piling up. The thing about it though was that it didn't pack down at all. When an APC would run into a knee-high drift of ash, the ash wouldn't crush down like snow or dirt, but instead it would fly up. So whenever we took a step, we would stir up even more of the stuff. An APC driver switched on his headlights. It was getting darker and I guessed that night was near. So I turned my own headlamp on, its beam piercing the constant flurry of ash thrown up by my footsteps. As more ash rained down from the nuclear cloud above our heads, there was a sudden blip on my thermal sensor. A few others had picked up the same signal, and I signaled them to come to me. Come on, it's coming from that depression over there, I said as we started off running as stealthily as we could through the ash, which billowed up to give away our position. I held my Tesla rifle at the ready, prepared to give any attacker a jolt, which would at very least stop his heart if not burn him alive. The blip remained still and as we neared the depression, I edged forwards, remaining low preparing myself to kill whoever had somewhere remained alive through the nuclear explosion. Taking a deep breath, I moved forwards another few inches, and then rolled over the edge of the depression and pointed my Tesla rifle at two children. They were burned, but the hole behind them explained how they had survived. They had taken cover in a shelter, and come out at probably the worst time possible. The radiation levels would still be astronomical. It had only been eight or nine hours since the city had been bombed, and radiation needed at least two or three days to even begin to disperse. I turned and called the others down into the depression, which had undoubtedly been the basement of a house mere hours before. The children huddled in the ashes, clearly afraid of us. Uh, come on, let's go. They're already half dead, someone said, and I nodded. They were right. Spending even only a few minutes in such a radiation-heavy environment would be sufficient to give you radiation poisoning. And we were already short on supplies to cure that particular malady. So, without waiting any further, we trooped out of the depression the children's soft sobs accompany us long after we had left sight of the place. The cloud was beginning to dissipate, leaving the ash a coat sky slightly lighter but still plenty dark. As we rejoined the slow moving column, I looked around us for what seemed like the thousandth time, each time with the same falling ash and desolation all framed in the odd half-light that the nuclear debris allowed through. The ash was still falling, but not as thickly now, and I hoped that it would quit falling soon. I didn't like the stuff and could smell its burned odor through the filters of my suit. As I walked along, 
I wiped a layer of ash off the barrel of my Tesla rifle and hoped not to encounter any more survivors. I had only come into contact with a few. In the early days of the war, we had rescued them, but now more increasingly, we had abandoned them and shot them if pursued. We didn't have enough radiation poisoning medicine and suits for even our own troops. They were expensive to make and broke constantly in the harsh conditions of the front. We couldn't afford to waste any on enemy civilians. I hadn't yet encountered an armed enemy, and I constantly thought of how ironic it was that I was participating in the bloodiest war in human history, but had yet to fire a single shot in combat. I had shared this with others, but they usually didn't listen having actually fought against armed enemies before. Compared to the others in my platoon, I was new. A few had fought in the deserts of Afghanistan, but more had fought in Pakistan and Korea. Those were the last conventional wars. Radiation-free fights that hadn't lasted long before things started going downhill. I had joined in hope of going to Pakistan, but the war had ended while I was in training and instead of fighting in fatigues. I was now fighting histories, at first a nuclear war in a bulky nuclear suit, holding a prototype electrical gun that fired what looked like bolts of lightning. I kicked at a lump of melted glass lying in my path and watched as it shattered against the low stump of a wall, each piece throwing off a dull glow in the nuclear twilight. How bright everything used to be, when glass shattered in the old days, it sparkled, throwing little spears of light into your eyes, and although I thought it annoying at the time, looking at the little shards of glass in my path, I missed the light, the annoying brightness that I had taken for granted when it had still existed. Of course, it still did exist in some places. If you flew up high enough in a bomber, you could see the daylight sparkling above you in the upper atmosphere, where the swirling debris from our nuclear war hadn't quite reached yet. But even as I thought about that, I knew that it would vanish as soon as well. The world was turning sepia, atomic dust seeping into everything. I wondered what had happened to my family during the early tumultuous days of the war when we hadn't perfected our nuclear shields enough to make missiles obsolete. Nukes had plastered the country, every country in fact. Russia had ceased to exist under heavy bombardment from China. Germany had annihilated Iran with some sort of chemical disintegration fog before retreating underground. And the Swiss had quietly sealed themselves into their hollow mountain bases waiting for an end to ceaseless explosions that rock the surface world. Thinking about it now, I remembered the distant glow on the horizon from the first nuke that had hit Los Angeles, and the rumble of the destabilized San Andreas Fault. I miss those days. Those days when at least there was a hope that we would stop nuking each other before the sky turned brown, and then gray, and then this ugly, mottled sepia that I feel like I've been walking in forever. Now, although I knew that I would survive this, now that every other fraction on Earth was too weak to muster a respectable army or even launch a decent nuke, I still miss the old days when the sun had actually shined down upon us, and when I had actually had a definite home, instead of this moving camp, and when we had had actual sunlight, much more precious than the vitamin D enrichment lamps that we were required to stand under for at least 10 minutes in order to maintain proper vitamin balances within our bodies. I was free to go. My term of service had ended a year along with everyone else's, but nobody ever did leave the column. Doing so was death. For all we knew, the camp could be the last truly safe place on earth, 
apart from wherever our nukes are being flown in from. Thinking about it, I felt as if I couldn't possibly all be real. The world was enveloped in a nuclear smog, and I was on the front lines of that, helping make it all happen. The buildings that had at least partially survived the blast were drawing near, and I knew that once I had reached them, that's where we would probably stop and set up for the night. Setting up portable radiation shelters and the like. Perhaps even a screen so that we could watch a movie. Things like that were supposed to keep morale up. And although most of the movies they showed us were comedies, all they made us do was long for home even more. If home even existed still. Thinking of that, I looked at the blurred forms of the distant buildings. They were little more than skeletons now. Only the titanium frames having survived the nuke. But despite that, I was slightly gladdened by a glimpse of a proper non-military civilization, no matter how abstract. It took us a long time to reach the buildings, but once we did... The rear troops wasted no time in setting up a small city of portable radiation shelters and as I had hoped earlier, a screen. We ate, relished our brief time without our suits, and then put them back on and trooped out to the area where they had put up the screen. They were showing Dr. Strangelove that evening. How fitting, I thought. How fitting. If there's a roadblock on the mountain pass, turn around. Written by Corner Cornea. Don't get out of the car, I begged. I'm just gonna go take a look, he told me. I couldn't even see the end of the line. There were about 20 or more cars ahead of us and more beyond the bend. Just stay in the car. Let me go talk to somebody up there. What if you get up there and then the cars start moving again? I turned towards them. Marcus, look at me. You're not going to leave me here. He began to move towards the door. Marcus! What? You see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You don't get it. You just don't get it. What? Are you serious? I couldn't believe it. This is what I'm talking about, Marcus. I'll only be gone for a... When I agreed to go on this cross-country road trip with you, I told you... I told you, Marcus, that there will be some places where you can't leave me by myself. Didn't I tell you that? And what did you say? I wouldn't leave your side for a heartbeat or else I would die of heartache. Oh, shut the heck up. He sat back begrudgingly in his seat. Fine. Good. So, what do you think they're doing up there? I don't know, I replied. I could tell that he wanted to say something, but he opted to keep his mouth shut and began to scroll through his phone. We had talked about this before, which made it all the more frustrating. I wished that he could just get it, and at the same time I wished that he never had to feel that kind of fear. He was so carefree and laid back, I remember thinking that the first time that we met. His confidence oozed into my aura when my friend had introduced us during lunch and he hadn't even said a word except for my name. Call it a gut feeling, but it has never steered me wrong. That level of self-confidence has led to physical altercations on more than one occasion and Marcus wasn't necessarily an imposing figure. It was his attitude towards danger. The calmness in the situation that made him move differently than everyone else that was shouting and screaming. It was when we first began dating. We were at a bar and from the moment that I saw it, I knew that I shouldn't have been there. But I liked the guy so much that I still went in. I remembered stepping through the doors and mama's words were filling my ears. That boy is going to get you into trouble. I instantly felt like a shadow among the clouds. 
more than a pair of eyes and noticed when I walked in. It weren't only the men, it was the women too. And before I could turn around and go straight home, I see him walking towards me. He's smiling and I instantly forgot what I was so worried about. Hey, I'm glad you made it, he told me. Same. So, what are you drinking? I cleared my throat. Uh, something bottled. His head turned slightly and smiled. Okay, beer it is. My nerves were getting to me. And honestly, I haven't felt that way since I was a kid. It's the best way that I could explain it. He looked at the bartender and held up two fingers. When he turned back to look at me, from my corner cornea, I noticed the bartender give me that look. At its core, it is demeaning. Its purpose is to diminish value and it worked. I felt lesser than myself. For a second, I didn't know if I was going to be served, but the bottles were eventually plunked in front of us. So, where are you coming from? I just got out of class. Oh, right. What's your major? Biochemistry. I knew you were smart. He took a swig of his beer. So, master's, undergrad. I'm currently working on my undergrad, but I want to get my PhD. I could feel the bartender snore to my chest. It coated my throat as I swallowed. Whoa, that's crazy cool. So a doctor, huh? Yeah, I can see it. The bartender snorted again, and then spit in the sink as he wiped a glass. And for the first time that night, I think Marcus realized what was going on. He kept talking to me, but kept an eye on the man behind the counter. It must be tough, you know, a lot of studying. I nodded. Yeah, so what do you do? Tammy told me that you worked as a consultant. For the government? No, it's nothing that important, he said. I fulfill contracts. Military contracts. He takes another drink. No, nothing of that sort. Not really. Mostly pen caps and, um, stationary supplies. Pen caps? What does that even mean? He finished his beer and told me, Hey, I'm going to the restroom. I'll be right back. And before I could object, Marcus had gotten out of his seat and was walking towards the end of the hall. Come back. I wanted to say to him, but he was already too far away and the sinking feeling that had disappeared earlier, it had started crawling back. To this day, I don't know exactly what happened. Two guys that were at the bar had approached me. The hairs on my neck knew that they weren't friendly. I wish I could have said that. I told them to screw off, but I didn't. I knew that even if I had tried to leave then, they wouldn't have let me go. So I sat there and tried not to anger them. I tried to be hollow, except they weren't having it. And that was when I knew that it didn't matter what I tried. I could have played that same moment in time with a million more lives and nothing would have changed in their minds. They were determined to hurt me. Drown a blend in, is what one of the men said. Couldn't fool me, said the other. Why don't you two sit back down? I heard Marcus say from the blue. They turned around. One of them grabbed his collar. Marcus broke his arm. The other guy punched in nothing but air and then found himself face flat on the counter. The bartender drew his gun and pointed it at Marcus. Get the heck out of my bar, the bartender roared. I was shaken as Marcus led me by the elbow. Some people stood up as we walked past. Marcus swung the door open and we stepped outside, greeted by the familiar surroundings of downtown. Cars hummed along. Couples were taking a 90 stroll at the Cesar Chavez Park, and the summer air touched my skin. The smell of popcorn nearby with the sounds of laughter almost made me throw up. It felt surreal. As if I had stepped out of one plane of existence and into another, only a doorstep away. It says online that this area is prone to rock slides, Marcus told me, snapping me out of my memory and back into the car. And it's a one lane road, he grumbled. We might be stuck here for a while. A couple of cars in front of us was a blue SUV. The door opens and a man steps out. 
I can tell that he's tall as his shoulder hovered above the roof of the vehicle. He slams the door and starts making his way down the line. I'll ask that guy what's going on when he gets back, Marcus told me. That sounds like a good idea, I said. Minutes pass as we sat in silence, only for the air to be broken by the sounds of a couple behind us stretching out their legs. What do you think is going on? The man asked the woman. Oh, it's probably that ledge I told you about last month, the woman replied. Oh, right, the netting. It looked loose, huh? God, we're going to be here all day at this rate, the woman complained. Several cars in front of us, another car door opens. A woman gets out and runs to the woods immediately to her left. She disappears from view. Well, everyone knows who's going to take a piss, Marcus laughed. I couldn't help but smile. I'm <laughs> glad it's not me. I went before we left the hotel. He pulled up his phone, the coordinates and the GPS blared on the screen. Look, we're only 22 miles away, can you believe it? It's almost around this bend down the mountain. Some inner roads and bam, we're here. I could almost jog there, he complained. I'm sure they'll clear up the road soon enough. It's likely that they only have one part of the road cleared, he groaned. They might even let the other cars go first, and who knows how many cars are waiting on the other side. I see a work truck rumbling by. It looks like they might be done soon. I hope so. Then another truck. Then another. Hey, aren't they driving a little fast? I asked. Another truck roared past us. I could still see the dust that it had kicked up. Yeah, a bit. Marcus replied slowly. Oh crap, they're gonna hit that girl. Marcus laid his palm on the horn. I turned to look at what he was talking about. The girl who had gone to the bathroom was coming back from the woods and a tow truck and nearly took her out. It missed her by a fender. Before she could gather herself, another truck came tumbling out of the corner. The driver sees the girl in the last second and careens off the road, hitting a tree before it comes to a dead stop. Smoke is coming out of the hood and I can see the man's head slumped against the steering wheel. He's pressed against the horn and it's blaring. Oh my god, are they alright? I don't know, it looks bad, Marcus told me. We see someone ahead and get out of the vehicle, and they run towards the crash. I'm glad that someone else decided to help them and not Marcus. What the heck is he doing? Marcus has suddenly asked. Where is that guy going? The man that I thought was going towards the crash had instead completely passed out. He is running into the woods, Marcus exclaimed. What's going on? I asked. Marcus reached for the door handle again. I'm going to lend a hand. No, Marcus, please. What are you talking about? Listen, someone has to go check up on that guy in the truck. I grabbed his arm. He wrings himself from my grasp. Call 911, he told me. That guy is going to need an ambulance. He slams the door behind him and locks it. The car beeps. My hands are shaking as I fiddle with my phone. I'm trying to call 911 when I start to hear people screaming. I look up and see people getting out of their cars. They're running towards me. I look towards the woods, trying to find Marcus at the crash site, but I can't find him. There are so many people running away. Men, women, children. Entire families had abandoned their vehicles and were running back down the mountain. The car alarm blares as someone runs face first into the hood. I could feel their body thud against the steel. I open the door. Marcus! I make my way towards the front of the car. The young girl was bleeding from her head. Marcus! I screamed as I grabbed the girl from her arm. Can you stand? She shrugs her shoulders. I put most of her weight on me as I help her up. Marcus! There's so many people running out in front of me that I can't see anything but the top of the trees in the distance. There's luggage and shoes on the floor. An ice chest. I see a doll being trampled by the endless footprints stampeding past me. Mark! He suddenly appears at my side and immediately grabs the girl from me and tosses her onto the floor. 
Marcus, what the heck? I turned angrily towards him. I almost didn't recognize the man standing in front of me. The look on his face, it was one of pure terror. His eyes are wide and his mouth is slacked open. The color is drained from his skin and everything looks sunken into his face. He grabs me by the arm and starts to drag me into the crowd. His grip on my forearm feels as if it'll crush my bones. Marcus, what's going on? Where are we going? I yelled. A big man running towards me crosses his arms and completely bulldozes me flat. My head hits the pavement. I can't hear. My body doesn't even feel the people stepping on me as they run past. I try to breathe, but the air gets stuck in my throat and all I can do is choke. I'm trying to stand, pulling on anything in my grasp. Someone tumbles as I reach out. I feel as if I'm about to be drowned by a sea of bodies. I can't breathe. I claw away at their limbs, their skin, and clothes, trying to get my head above the patch of blue overhead. I claw my way through the barrage of human bodies, digging my fingers into the endless torrent until finally my head swims above the surface and I take my first breath. It hurts the moment that I breathe. I fill my lungs again before the sea of people crash over me again, pulling me back beneath the waves and then up again as my body is being thrashed. As my head appeared above the waves, I get a glimpse of the bodies being mowed down ahead the headlights beaming towards us as someone is driving their vehicle on on the other side. They're running people over, I told myself, and I am in the way. It's going to crush me, I whispered as the swarm swallows me again. I feel the familiar grip on my arms. The wing in my forearm feels crushed beneath its grip. It digs into the space between my bones, squeezing the sinew as it drags me out. Marcus, I screamed. The crowd keeps pushing us further down the road until we reach the turnout that is facing the forest. Marcus, we've got to go now. He pulls me roughly from the loop of my pants. I nearly fall over again from the forest. Marcus drags us past the crashed vehicle and starts running towards the trees. I can hear a helicopter above us, its rotors thwacking the air as it splits the sky open. Marcus, what the heck is going on? But he keeps running. My feet chase after him, scraping along the forest floor, being ragdolled by the trees as I slam into them in my pursuit. My eyes are glued into his back as we come to an open field. My fingers wrap themselves tightly around his shirt when I catch up. My chest is heaving and my hand is on my knee. My lungs are on fire as I gasp for air. If I weren't so tired, I would have noticed immediately that something was wrong. Marcus was rigid beside me, colder than stone. When I finally looked up, I realized that we weren't in an open field at all. Every tree in sight was bent at the base of their trunk. They weren't snapped in half or laying on the floor. They were bent over. It was like a sea of trees had been swept flat. I can't believe they brought it here. Marcus suddenly spoke. A million thoughts raced through my head. You know what this is? The same look earlier still etched into his face. Uh, I never thought they would bring it here. What's here? What are you talking about? There's no time. We have to keep running. He pulls me through the field of bent trees until the mountain shoots straight up into the sky again. We have to climb. I look up. It's a sheer cliff. I feel like a bug looking up the side of a cupboard, except I don't have any claws or wings. I can't stick myself to the edge. I shake my head. No, no way. I can't do that. Marcus pulls me towards him with both of his hands. You're hurting me. He doesn't lose in his grip. If we don't climb, now it's over. It's going to come and get us. And there will be nothing that we can do. Nothing. Do you understand me? There will be nothing, no one, anyone, anywhere on this planet could do. It'll all be over. The look in his eyes told me that he believed this with every fiber of his being. I nodded and felt his grip loosen around my arms. 
I'm going to help you up first. You keep climbing. I'll help you when I can. If you get stuck, I'll call out directions. If you fall, I will catch you. If I fall, don't stop. Keep climbing. Do not look back down. Find a safe place to hide. Do you understand? I nodded again. Marcus looks up and points. You see that path? He traces the mountain with his finger. It looks steep, but there are a lot of places to hold on to. He waves his hand across a section above. There. We'll have to move to the left. The rock formation indicates that a natural opening could be nearby. Maybe even a cave system that leads deeper into the mountain. If we hide there until morning, we might have a chance. He starts to push me up the wall. I had never climbed anything except the kitchen counter to get something off the top shelf. I was terrified to say the least. But somehow, my hands found one ledge after another. Push up with your legs. It'll take the stress off your shoulders and fingers. I hear him yell from below me. Grab, push, grab, push, grab. My arms swing wildly as a rock comes loose in my hands. For a moment, I am hanging in midair and all I can think about is, Oh, this is how Wily Coyote does it. Except for Marcus, it wouldn't let me fall. I feel this palm on my lower back and I'm pushed flat against the rock wall again. I hit the mountain hard. There are blinks of white lights in my vision, but somehow I manage to hold on. My fingers are bleeding, but I've got a good grip. A part of me wanted to stay there and never move again. Perhaps I would blend in. No one would be expecting to look halfway up some random mountain for people dangling there, right? My thoughts are swarming when I hear it. I know it's a sound that I will never forget. My body stiffens and I want to be a rock so badly. It sounds like wood popping in the fireplace. Pieces of sap that are trapped, which burst from the intense heat. The only difference being it wasn't a piece of wood. Nor was it only one tree. It was an entire forest being crushed. The sounds of each log hitting the ground at the same time shook the mountain. Pieces of rock began to fall around and above me. I turned my head to look below. My eyes barely above the tree line, and the giant trunks fall by the hundreds. It was coming for us. Move, 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 move! Marcus yells from below. I feel his hands urging me to climb, but my knees feel like jelly. He jams his fingers hard into my butt. The shock wakes me up. The pain splinters my thoughts and I can feel my eyes start to water. Move! He shouts at me like a drill sergeant. Pick up your legs and go. Now, now, now. I bend my knee and push myself upward. I can still feel his jab every time I push on. My hands are scrambling. My mind just keeps telling me to grab and push. To keep this motion until my hands find nothing but air. I start to panic. It was grab and push, grab and push. But they had changed it on me. I look down but Marcus hasn't noticed yet. And then it hits me. Left. This must be where I start pushing left. I look to the left and see more handholds. The technique was different, but it was easy to fall into a routine as I made my way left and up. When I had run out of holds, I found myself climbing onto a flat part of the mountain. I scrambled onto the ledge and my body dropped to the floor like a sack of rocks. I had never been this exhausted before. My arms and legs were screaming, and each breath felt as if they were taken in front of a lighter, pressed close to my mouth. I turned to look out at the forest below. Get up! Marcus grabs me from my armpits and hoists me back onto my feet. We have to keep moving. There, look. He points up ahead, but my eyes are so tired that when I turn them, I can feel them sticking in their sockets. He drags me most of the way. I can feel him slowing down beneath me, so I force my legs to stand, to take the weight off of him. I look up and finally see what he was pointing at. It was the shape of a mouth, protruding out of the bones of the mountain. A cave. Marcus pushes me up an uneven patch and I step into the shadows. I can smell the damp walls and it's much cooler in here. I see steam coming off my skin as it's cooling down. 
I turn around to the entrance of the cave and see Marcus's silhouette in the light. I can see him breathe in a sigh of relief as he starts to walk in. Every step seems so slow. Every breath feels so heavy. Everything, except the long arm that presses itself against the cave entrance. It was the size of an elephant trunk. It pressed itself flat against the rock as if searching, feeling, feeling its way blindly in the dark until it senses Marcus. The antenna-like appendage snaps out and thrusts itself into his back. There's no look of surprise. It was too fast. It snatched Marcus off his feet and snaps out of the cave. In less than a second, he was gone, and I'm left standing there alone. My brain still trying to process what had happened. Was it even real? I reached my hand out to where he could have been standing. Come back. I don't know how many hours I stood there, looking out from the cave. I know that I watched as the sun went down. The shades of orange and red turned into blue as black as night. The entire time waiting for something to happen. For Marcus to come back. Or that thing to come and take me too. Except nothing happened. And when daylight broke, I finally stepped outside. I looked up at the mountain where the tentacle had pressed itself against the rocks and noticed that it left the lip of the cave completely flat, as if somebody had sliced the rock with a sharp blade and then polished it. Somehow, my feet and arms found a way down the mountain. I crossed the field of bent trees, found my way through the narrow forest, and eventually came back to the main road. Holy crap! It was the voice from a young man, an officer. He couldn't have been more than twenty. He ran towards me as I exited the woods. Uh, we found another one. He grabs me close and puts his brown jacket around me. You're okay now, you're safe. He keeps on repeating. But in my head, all I could think about was, there are survivors? The red lights of the ambulance flash as I'm soon transported off the mountain. We're taking you to Mercy. It's right at the foot. That's where most people were transported to. The EMT puts her hand on my shoulder. Is there anyone that I can help you find? When we arrived at the hospital, some doctors and nurses checked me out. The EMT stopped by and sadly reported that Marcus wasn't on the list. He might be at one of the other hospitals, she said. Some were flown off by helicopters. I was taken to a room with about 20 beds. When I had fallen asleep, they were all filled. When I woke up, they were empty, and two men in navy blue suits came in. One of them stood by the door while the other pulled up a chair and sat next to me. I'm terribly sorry about your entire ordeal. How are you feeling? I squinted slightly and shrugged. I I'm alright. What's good to hear? You need anything? A coffee, perhaps? I'd like something a bit stronger. I smiled. He smiled back. Wouldn't we all? He turned to look at his partner. Get her something nice afterwards, okay? The other man nodded. So, he turns to look at me. My name is Sam. I'm an intelligence officer for the DIA. I shake my head. Who? We're the Defense Intelligence Agency. We report directly on foreign anomalies. He pulls out a badge and he shows it to me. I'm required to take eyewitness testimony of the events that had unfolded. I know it's terrible timing, but the more information we have, perhaps the more people in need we could find. He pauses and pulls out a notepad from inside his jacket lining. It says here that you were traveling with a companion. I nodded. Marcus, my boyfriend. Do you know where he is currently? I shake my head. No, we got separated. When? I was in the car and Marcus had gotten out to help one of the workers who had crashed into a tree. He told me to stay put and lock the door. Then what happened? I'm not sure. People started running and screaming. There was a young lady who ran into my car and I tried to help her. But by the time I got there, she was already running again. Do you know what happened to her? Did she make it? 
what did she look like? At 21, 22 perhaps, had a shoulder length brown hair, a tattoo on her neck. I think it was a butterfly. I could hear Marcus in my head. Good, good. Establish yourself as a reliable witness with details. I'll look into it, Sam replied. He wrote something down on his notepad. I shook my head. I should have stayed in the car, shouldn't I have, Sam? His partner said to me, Rushing to someone's aid. That's a hero in my book. Sam nodded. It's often difficult to react. Even the most trained people hesitate. He turns to look at me. What happened after you stepped out of the vehicle? I got lost, mostly in the crowd. I looked up at him. There were so many people, I don't even know where they were coming from. It was chaos. I've never been so scared of being trampled in my life. And I've been to football games in Oakland. Sam kept nodding. After you left the vehicle, when did you meet up with Marcus? I didn't. We never found each other. I got tossed around by the Masha people and found myself running away. Everyone was trying to get off the mountain, but I couldn't get back into that crowd again. Where did you go? I ran through the field where they were logging or something. Tons of trees were cut down. There was nowhere for me to hide, so I just kept running. Until I found a cave. I ran inside and waited until morning. Sam continued nodding. And at any time did you see anything else? Something abnormal? A person, perhaps? Or an event that could help us locate a missing, you know? I shook my head. I was so scared, you know. Good, Marcus cooed. Use his own words. I was just so grateful that they rescued me. Sam closed his notebook. I'm glad we were able to find you. He stood up. Someone from the police department will be here shortly to get an official statement. Rest well and I hope to have more information for you soon. Be in touch. The pair left my room. Later, the doctor would come by and clear me for discharge and the officer that had come in to take my statement led me to a group waiting in the lobby. The county is putting everyone up until this mess is cleared. They've rented a place nearby where most of you will be staying, the officer told me. Maybe they'll find your boyfriend while we're waiting. They all looked banged up. Is this everyone? One of the women asked. She was tall, about 5'10". Where are all of the others? Yeah, there were some 40 or 50 people that came in with us. Where is everyone? Asked a shorter woman wearing red. Well, I'm not sure, the officer told us. It could be that some of them needed some more attention than previously thought or... They were flown out to hospitals that were better equipped. So, it's just the four of us? Asked the woman in red. Well, five. The officer corrected her. He tilted his head towards a corner bench where a man was sitting down with his hands in his face. I heard he lost his wife and daughter. Came a soft voice. I think they were being pushed by that crazy mob. And they fell off the side of the mountain. One of the other women said... She looked at me. Hi, I'm Irene. She turned to the tall woman and said, That's Jill, and the lady in red is Guadalupe. Hi, I'm... Your transportation will be here in about 15 minutes. Please gather up your things and be ready by the front door. The officer told everyone. If you need anything, please do not hesitate to ask. He finished by walking over to the man in the corner. The officer knelt before him. I couldn't hear what was being said. Four women and a man. Joe came from behind. Staying together. Why didn't they just put us up in a hotel or something? Uh, maybe there wasn't any rooms available. Irene said. We are sort of in the middle of nowhere. Oh, come on. You're acting as if you've never lived in a co before. Guadalupe said. Jill shook her head. No, I went to an all-girls Catholic school. And in all girls after. Guadalupe rolled her eyes. I'm Mexican. My entire family is made up of Catholics. And we know to be nice to thy neighbor. Jill shrugged. I was just saying. So, did anyone see what was going on? Irene asked. No. 
I just saw a bunch of white people running and I knew it wasn't going to be anything good. Joe replied. Guadalupe laughed. Aren't you white? Yeah, and I was out running. What are you talking about? Joe smiled. They turned to look at me. And did you see anything? I shook my head. I didn't see anything at all. The state trooper opened the door and let us in. Everything we paid for by the county. He went ahead to check the rooms as our gangly group ground to a halt at the entrance landing. The kitchen is on the second floor, he called out. Some volunteers had stocked the place. You're all welcome to anything that is here. I've never seen a kitchen on the second floor, Joe replied. We're in the mountains, and most everyone has one. It's a great place to entertain and quite the captivating view, I told her. She seemed surprised. I worked as a realtor for six years. That explains everything, Guadalupe replied. It was my turn to be surprised. Staunch shoulders, she said. You were born with natural shoulder pads uh, for suits. Only Irene chuckled. Oh, come on, ladies. Oh, and Robert. Can't forget about Robert. I don't believe anyone forgot about Robert. I could hear him crying in the back of the SUV the entire time. I felt for him, really, I did. But everyone in that car had lost us yesterday. Everyone had a reason to cry. Let's get up these stairs. Irene slowly started the ascent. It seemed to me as if her right leg was troubled. Irene was the oldest one of the five of us. I wanted to help her up, but the idea of lifting my legs up any more steps made me wince. I couldn't bear it. I started to head deeper into the first floor. Hey, where are you going? Jill asked. She loomed in the hallway. She was about 5'10", perhaps 5'11", now that I took a look at her. For some reason, I've always felt that a woman at those heights was always a larger built than a man of the same. She was towering, her size intimidating. I pushed past her, finding a room. I walked down the long hallway and into a second living room. A small flat screen TV was hooked to an old PlayStation console. There were four doors on the left. I tried the first door. It was a broom closet, some buckets and cleaning supplies, a toiletries, and a cheap plaque guaranteeing the cleanliness of each unit. It must be an investment property for someone, and they hired a third party to maintain their rental. I tried the next day and found a children's room, 8 by 10 if I had to guess. There were two single beds on either side of the wall and an empty closet. I looked out at the only window in the room, and it faced at the fence, typical of a kid's room. I pulled down the blinds and pointed them upwards. I learned that if they were pointed down, someone outside could look in. It's an old realtor trick to keep the house as discreet as possible, to bring more appointments to the listing. But for tonight, it would serve as a freebie barrier to the outside world as I slapped. I threw my luggage on one of the beds and I locked the door behind me. Mirrored bifold doors hung on the closet. I took a gander at myself for the first time in what seemed like weeks. My hair had begun to curl as the products wore off. The trace amounts of eyeliner and foundation were gone, leaving a pallid texture behind. The clothes I wore draped across my frame were donations from the hospital staff as mine had become tatters. I eased myself closer to the mirrors as I slid off my jeans. The action alone made my elbow shake. I managed to pull it beneath my thigh as I looked at it in the mirror. The wound is still oozed with blood. I could smell the stench now as it was laid open to the air. It hurt with every step that I took. The doctor said that it required four stitches to keep from splitting to my vaginal opening. You won't be able to hold in your bowel movements for some time. You'll need to wear incontinence pads until you've healed. The doctor told me at the hospital. You said you fell on something. The truth kept playing in my head. If only I hadn't stopped moving. If only I didn't hesitate for that second when we were climbing. Perhaps Marcus wouldn't have been taken. 
A fraction of a second could have possibly changed everything. A loud knock on the door made me jump. The pus from my wound bled through the patio. and still, I pulled up my pants. What? I called out. Hey, it's Jill. The rest of us decided that Irene would have the master bedroom on the second floor, as it's closest to the kitchen and the living and dining, she explained. That way, she doesn't have to keep climbing the stairs. You good with that? Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Okay, if you're hungry, they're making food upstairs. I'll be right up. There is a pause. And we found something. Don't know if you... Is it about the other survivors? No, nothing like that. It's just, well, come upstairs. They're making a big deal out of it, but maybe you could shed some light on it. I opened the door. What's going on? They found a locked door upstairs. Jill began to lead the way up. When we came to the stairs, I gritted my teeth and followed her. I told them that it's nothing, but honestly... I've never seen it before at any Airbnb that I've rented. She turned to me. Um, but you're a realtor, right? I thought you could maybe tell us a bit about it. And when we made it to the top of the stairs, the kitchen opened up to our view. Robert, Irene, and Guadalupe were standing around the counter. Various plates of food were in shallow bowls. Where's the trooper? Irene handed me a plastic plate. There's some snacks on the table. The trooper already laughed, said something about being needed back at the hospital. Guadalupe told me. Fancy place, ain't it? She motioned to these solid wood beams and high ceilings. They even have a Thor. I always see them in fancy homes. Joe said there's a locked room. Oh, yeah, in Irene's room, right next to her bed. Guadalupe popped a grape into her mouth. Creepy if you ask me. Can someone show it to me? Uh, sure, Irene said. She got up and led me down the hall to the right. The master bedroom opened up to a sitting area with a king-sized bed at the end. She walked over to the door closest to her side of the bed. She jiggled the handle. Just a locked door, she told me. The other three were behind me, crowding the walkway. I went out of her look at the handle. Uh, medico. I said aloud. It's an expensive lock, nearly custom. You have to show your ID and register for it. They're nearly impossible to pick. Why would you need to show an ID to purchase a door lock? Robert asked. They could be afraid of it being used for locking someone in against their will, Guadalupe said. If it can't be picked or whatever. Now let me take a crack at it. Jill scarfed down the remainder of her toast and pulled out a needle that was hidden in her sleeve. Do you always have that? I asked. Never leave home without them, she smiled. After several minutes of watching her try to pick the lock, the girl finally gave up. It's not going to budge. I've seen my fair share of locks broken to them too, but this one is solid. Anyone else notice a similar lock in the house somewhere else? I asked. This caused a great shuffling. Not a word was spread amongst us as we scoured the house. When we regrouped in the kitchen, it was Robert who spoke. There's one downstairs in the garage. Same lock. I tried the handle and it wasn't going anywhere. It could be a broom closet, Irene asked. If it is, then there would be three broom closets in this house. I saw one downstairs near the rooms, but it was unlocked, I told them. This place is big, but I'm certain that the locked door in Irene's room is one of the walk-in closets for the master bedroom. Uh, you think the owners have their stuff in there? Robert asked. That way, they don't have to pack as much when they come here themselves. Yeah, that could be it. Or someone is hiding inside and they're waiting for us to go to sleep. Guadalupe chuckled. It's not funny, Jill said. It's not uncommon for empty houses to have squatters, stragglers, or frogging. I told them. I met a few cases myself. What's frogging? Irene asked. People secretly living in homes, hiding in other rooms or closets or in an attic. Guadalupe said quietly. What? It was all over the news a couple of years ago. 
There was a guy, right, who got a divorce and his wife and kids moved out of their big house. And no one was aware that they had an uninvited guest the entire time. Yeah, I heard about that. Robert spoke up. How no one knew still blows my mind. Guadalupe nodded. The husband didn't even notice until one day when he ran out of creamer for his coffee. So, he gets the milk from the fridge. It's a brand new one, so he pops it off and pours some in. He does this for several days as he hadn't had time to run to the store. But he started to notice that the milk was disappearing faster than he was using it. He didn't want to admit it, but something felt wrong. Eventually, his uneasiness causes him to set up security cameras all over his house. She turns to look at Robert. At first, he monitors it every hour, but after a few days, the novelty of spying on his empty house grows dull. So after about a week, he promptly forgets all about it and goes back to his busy work schedule. Then one day when he's sitting on the toilet, he finds ribbons of notifications on his phone. They seem endless. He clicks through them and sees that it's from the security app that came with the cameras. He hasn't checked them out in a while and they've been piling up. Still, it seemed more than a single man in a house could make so. He starts looking through them. It's mostly blue and green images of his house and him walking around. You'd mostly find videos of me walking around naked. Joe tried to joke. I'm walking around the house. But in one video he notices something out of place. There's a movement in one of the kitchen cupboards. So he thumbs through it. The door swings open, and out splits a contorted mess of crumpled limbs. It begins to unfold itself on the tiled floor. Even in the low quality footage, the man could see the joints popping back into place. Crick crack, crick crack goes the bones on the screen. And as the neck turns around, he realizes that it's a woman behind the stunted form. She's in a blue gown with her hair down to her knees. She walks over to the fridge and opens it up, grabs the milk and pops off the lid. She puts her lips on the plastic and begins to drink. Irene put her coffee cup down on the counter. Jill is shaking her head and didn't even brush her teeth. Guadalupe continues. The man frantically scrolls through the videos and he starts to see the woman everywhere, sometimes even when he's sleeping. She stands outside of his door for hours and just waits. And there are many times when he's missed her by a hair, such as when he's rushing out the door, whether it be getting his jacket on or trying to find his work bag. She's standing from the corners of his cornea just out of sight. The notifications keep popping up as he scrolls. My eyes search the cupboards lining the tops of the kitchen, looking for anything out of place. Guadalupe looks at Irene. Finally, the man reaches a video that is playing with the date is current. It shows him coming home that day, of him getting a drink in the kitchen. Another video capture of him going up the stairs. He throws his bag onto the bed. And then the camera in the bathroom records him opening the door to the toilet where he sat now. And then it cuts to a video on the stairs. The woman is walking up them. The man couldn't believe it. This intruder was in his house right now. He started pulling up his pants to catch her in the act. There's a fury in his eyes and the toilet paper rolls onto the floor as he angrily snatches at them. But then another notification comes up. He looks down at it slowly and with a trembling finger he presses play. It shows the woman standing right outside of the door. Guadalupe's voice lowers and I lean forward to listen. Neighbors hear screaming and shouting. The police were eventually called and when the officer on site opened the door to the bathroom, the walls were smeared in crap and the man is sitting there dead and on the wall is written, Coexistence. And we all stood there in silence around the island in the kitchen when Joe finally spoke. Crap, no wonder I get creeped out whenever I see those bumper stickers while I'm driving. And Guadalupe smiled tiredly. Yeah, yeah, that was the point of the story. We finished pieces of dinner in the Connor and spoke briefly about our experiences on the mountain. Then when I finally got back into my room, I could barely keep my eyes closed. They kept darting to the door. Nearly an hour goes by and I'm staring at the ceiling when I hear a soft knock. 
Hey, it's me. I recognized the voice as a Guadalupe's. Yeah, come in, I told her. She opens the door up slowly in her hand is a bottle. Degreaser, she says. I found it under one of the sinks. I'm going around and hitting all the hinges with it. It'll make them squeak when they're opened. I smiled. Where did you ever learn that? You know, here or there. Also, Jill is putting up Christmas wreaths in the locked doors. There's little bells on them. She come up with that on her own? I asked. No, it was Irene's idea. Guadalupe sat on the opposite bed. So, what do you think about everyone? She asked. Some of the things they said about the mountain were pretty wild. Yeah, I just can't believe people really ran Robert's daughter and wife off the mountain. The way that he was telling it after dinner, it's just awful. What about you, huh? You see anything unusual? She questioned. I shook my head. Um, I mostly hid for that entire night. I was hoping that someone would find me, but mostly I hid because it was cold. Good, good, Marcus's voice said. Don't draw masculine attention to yourself. Right, same. I hold up next to a partially hollowed out tree. She's lying. You were in the tree line? You saw those trees. She nodded. Yeah, really scary out there at night. She patted the bed. I uh, hope you get some sleep. The door squealed as she pulled it shut. When morning came, I changed my bandage, pulling off the old one and scraping the leaking fluids into a trash bag. I wiped myself clean and administered the ointment and placed a new bandage in its place before going back upstairs. I had taken a handful of painkillers, but climbing didn't get any easier. The sun poured into the kitchen magnificently, and Irene was there to greet me with a cup of coffee. She pulled open the fridge and dangled the jug in her hand. Milk? I groaned. Too soon, she laughed. I turned around with the warm cup in my hands and looked out the window. The mountain range filled every square in the frame. The tops were littered with snow and freshly minted flakes were falling from the sky. It's beautiful. Irene breathed. I wish my husband could have seen it. We were only a few hours away from our campsite. She smiled and looked at me. It's where we met, you know. 43 years ago. When I still had a good leg. She takes a sip of her coffee. I was with a bunch of girlfriends from college and we were on summer break. Him and his buddies came riding over on their motorcycles. She pulled up a picture on her phone. It was a snapshot of a Polaroid. He was so handsome, she said. Well, she finished quietly. At least it's a beautiful day. And I looked out the window. When do you think snow goes from beautiful to terrifying? I asked her. The snowstorm raged outside. In a few hours, it had grown from a gentle breeze into a hellish pelting that shook the house painfully. The front door rattled as each gust of wind threatened to throw it open. The snow piled on the roads and the sun had been blotched from the sky. It was midday but as dark as night. I could hear the wind screaming as it tore past the cabin, scratching its nails against the wood, itching to pull it all down. At this rate, we'll be buried, Robert said. I thought it was global warming, Irene commented. It's nearly April. I could see Jill biting her tongue, but in the end, she chose not to say anything. By the time Guadalupe joined us, the boiler had stopped working. What's going on? The water is freezing, she told us as she came up the stairs. I think the gas main is out. I told her. Power surging too, Joe pointed outside. Probably interference with the lines. Hey, has anybody got his cell phone connection? Robert could be heard. I watched from the window as the thick power cables bounced outside. Why is it moving like that? It's bouncing up and down, up and down as if being strummed violently. They look as if they're about to snap off. Ice built up at the edges, 
which causes the air to move around them weird. Looks like little invisible men are jumping on them. Yeah, Jill said. I shot her a look. What? I worked as a pole technician for a couple of years. One night began to settle, we each silently came to the conclusion that no one was going to be coming for us tonight. Robert had found some candles and set them around the kitchen. Guadalupe built a fire in the living room. I gathered blankets from the closets and brought them up. As Joe filled the sinks and tubs with water. Maybe we should all huddle up in here. I dropped the blankets in my arms. It's the only warm place left in the house. I don't mind sleeping in my room, Joe said. Do you think that's the best? Irene asked. I'll come back up if it gets too cold, she told us before heading to her room. Anyone able to get a hold of the trooper or the hospital? Guadalupe stoked the fire. I could feel the heat coming as she stroked the coals. I didn't realize that my bones were aching until then. I still don't have a connection, Irene said. Robert pulled out a crumpled yellow jacket from his bag. I'll be in my room, as he too left. Irene, Guadalupe, and I would split up the sectional in front of the fireplace. I don't know when I had fallen asleep, but even in my dreams, I'd hear the crackling of the wood in the hearth. They reminded me of the trees in the forest, flattening in front of me as I hung on the mountainside. I could hear Marcus clawing his way below me. Don't look down, he kept repeating. But it was the thing in the distance that scared me. I could see it from up here against the mountain. It was completely flat and the size of a football field. Its white underbelly contrasted by the pink rubbery flesh on its back, and the many tentacles flicking at the trees like a serpent's tongue as it moved across the land, searching for a hole. It looked like a giant tapeworm, spewing foam from the crooked teeth and closing its mouth. I remember thinking, it can't see me, can't possibly know that I'm here, it has no eyes. But then it turned to look at me and I swear that it didn't need them. I screamed as I woke up. I was covered in sweat. I had stopped screaming, but the wailing continued to fill my mouth. It was because Guadalupe was screaming too. Oh God, no! She kept screaming. Who did this? Which one of you did this? I turned to see Robert coming up the stairs and Jill standing frozen in the kitchen. In Guadalupe's blood-covered arms was Irene's body her throat cut from ear to ear. We have to call the police, I told them. Which one of you did it? Guadalupe yelled. Was it you? She rounded on Robert. I was downstairs in my room sleeping when I heard you screaming, he told her. And why would it automatically be me? You two were the ones sleeping closest to her. Guadalupe lunged at him, but Jill came between them. Stop, she yelled. He did it. Guadalupe said. I know that he did it. What are you talking about? Robert spat. I didn't do anything. I, I saw you, she yelled. On the mountain, I saw you. What? Jill and I turned to look at him. You pushed your wife and kids off the mountain. I saw you. What are you talking about? Your wife. She has blonde hair, right? And your little girl. She was wearing a pink dress with white strawberries. Guadalupe turned to us. I saw them when I was running, but I didn't recognize him until I saw that jacket that he put on. Guadalupe pointed a long, accosting finger at him. You had your hood down, and you were wearing that mustard-colored jacket when you stood next to them. I saw you push them off the cliff. She was gasping now. At the time, I was thinking, how could anyone do something so horrible? Come to find out that it's so much worse. It was their own family. You did it and I saw you. You don't know what you're talking about. Robert began quietly. I didn't kill my family. I could see his lip quivering. I didn't. They were coming so fast. The people started pushing us. Melissa was crying and my wife couldn't get her to shut the heck up. I was holding on to them but people just kept piling into us. Shut up. Guadalupe's tone was flat. Stop lying. She had gone into the kitchen and pulled one of the knives from the drawers. 
I saw you push them off. But I was slipping. So you push your wife and kids off the mountainside to save your own butt. Oh yeah, a real man. Guadalupe circled around the counters, the glint of the blade in her hand. Everyone was scared, Jill began. She had her hands out. Come on, Guadalupe, you were probably too far away to see what actually happened. Guadalupe raised the knife and pointed it at Robert. Something rolled off the tip and landed on the carpet. She looked down at the knife and dropped it when she realized it was covered in blood. Jill reached to confiscate the knife, but Robert shouted, Don't! There could be fingerprints on it! Jill looked at him for a second, and then slowly backed off as Robert rounded on Guadalupe, covering your tracks. What? She replied warily. You're developing an alibi on how your fingerprints got on the murder weapon. He mocked. You even planned for witnesses. He hissed. Why wouldn't I just wipe the blade down and put it away if I were the killer, you dummy? I don't know what kind of twisted thoughts are going up in your head. It wasn't me. Guadalupe shouted. Don't try and pin this on me. Just think about the chances that you open some random drawer and pull out the murder weapon. Robert scoffed. That's some BS and you know it. Except this time he wasn't speaking to Guadalupe. He was directing it at us. I think that it's better if the two of you stay in Irene's room. Joe began. I'm not staying in a room with that killer. Guadalupe yelled. It was him, I'm telling you. The two of you are going to regret this. She laughed. He's going to kill everyone. Will you shut the heck up? Robert shouted. I haven't killed anyone. How can you stand there on top of their desk with a clean conscience, sitting here denying it as if I and God didn't see you push them off? You coward. Robert struck her against the face. His fist closed as it connected. I watched as her head was thrown backwards from her shoulder as she collapsed onto the kitchen counter. Before I could react, Jill was on top of him. She had a leg wrapped around his midsection and her arms twisted around his neck. He slammed their bodies against the fridge. The cabinet shuddered and creaked as their doors rocked on its hinges. But Jill's grip never loosened. Not until Robert's eyes rolled back into his head, causing the two of them to fall onto the floor in a thud. Can you get her? Jill suddenly yelled at me. I shook myself awake. Oh, what? She tosses me long black zip ties. Get her hands and feet. I picked up the zip ties and my hands shook as I bound Guadalupe's wrists together. We need to call the police, I told her. They need to know what's going on. I, I agree. She holds up her cell phone. Except I can't get a signal out here. Can you? I looked down on my own phone and saw the no service warning in the corner. Jill finished tying Robert up and then propped him up against the fridge. Where did you learn how to do that? I asked her. What, the zip ties? Never leave home without them. No, the choking thing. Oh, she smiled. My dad owns a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym out in SoCal. She comes over and sits Guadalupe up and peels back an eyelid. In concussion, she told me. She slaps Guadalupe in the face. If she falls asleep, she might not wake up. Guadalupe eventually came around, but her speech was slurred. We gave her some water and then decided to move her closer to the couch. I could feel a pair of eyes on my back. The intensity causes me to whirl around, coming face to face with Robert who was wide awake and staring daggers into me. His facial expressions are motionless, as he sat there in silence while ungagged. He wasn't going to be out for long, Jill said. Hey, she snapped her fingers at my face. What do we say we try to get those locked doors open? How? Oh, brute force, Jill replied. Come on. When we got to the locked door in Irene's room, Jill took a deep breath and kicked it down the center. The bells on the wreath rung from the forest, but the door didn't budge. There's probably three inch screws in the wall studs, I told her. It was popularized a few years ago. I tapped the door. It's going to be nearly impossible to break down from here. I felt the edges, but I bet you they forgot to do the same thing to the hinges. Jill looked at me and smiled before pulling back her leg and kicking into the side of the door. It came loose from a crunching blow. We looked through the crack. Inside was a single fold-out desk and a chair. 
On the desk was a monitor that flaked on and off. Can you? Jill didn't need further convincing as she gave another kick, and the door mostly came apart. I moved the mouse on the desk and the screen came alive. Each part of the monitor was sectioned off into different parts of the house. In one of the panels, two figures were moving. It took me a second to realize that it was us. The video feed was showing our backs and I whirled around, staring into the dark room. They were watching us, Jill whispered. This entire time this place was bugged. I followed our images on the screen until I came to one of the picture frames hanging on the wall. My fingers brushed the edges until I noticed them cover the video feed in the closet. I moved my hand over the area again until I pinpointed the camera. It was in the center of one of those black screws holding up the picture. I would never have known it was there. Marcus's voice rang in my head. You have to be more diligent. I've got the Wi-Fi up, Joe told me. I turned around, still trying to make sense of everything. Where's the culprit? I asked. Hmm? Someone had to be sitting there. I pointed to the chair. Look, we should probably go tell the others. She nodded. They have a right to know. We could probably even untie Robert now. I added. Maybe, Jill said grimly. But after what I just did, he could prove to be more violent towards me if we let him go. It's one of the harsh realities when taking down a bigger opponent and not finishing them. They'll always pose a danger afterwards. We made our way out of the room and down the hall towards the kitchen. I winced as I heard the fire crackling as we drew closer. Hey, we managed to open the lock. There was no one there. Both Robert and Guadalupe were missing. We heard a clamor come from below and ran towards the window. Two figures trailing across the snow. They had come out of the garage. One of them was being dragged. Oh, crap, it's them, Joe whispered. We've got to do something. They probably still think that one of them did it. We ran down the stairs and opened the front door. The ice bit into my fingers as we dug our way out. The cold cut like a knife into my flesh. The tip plucking a wage tendon, pushing aside a vein, as it split the connecting tissue with each stroke, as I plunged my hands into the snow, clearing a path. Jesus, Jill yelled into the wind. It's freezing. She cupped her hands. Guadalupe, Robert. But it was no use. Her words were thrown to the wayside by the wind. I think I see them. I pointed across the road, uh, next to the light post. Before I could stop her, Joe ran out the door and she got as far as at the end of the driveway before stumbling onto the ice. The wind blew my ear numb so I couldn't hear her fall. But the image of her pinned to the ground told me that she was in trouble. Come back, I yelled. There's no way you're going to reach them. I didn't know if she could hear me, but she started to stand up. I saw her turn and look at me, and that was when the snow moved. It crawled. The snow top rolled like tiny little legs, almost as if an ice sheet were gliding. Chill, I screamed. Come back. She waved her arm at me, and then she was flat. The snow covered her quickly, crawling over her body, reaching around her throat in order to fill her mouth as the wind howled into the night. I froze in terror as I watched her being carried away, buried alive in the snow. I screamed and screamed, and found my legs as the wind battered me from all sides, but it was no use. She was taken. In the back of my mind, I knew what had taken her, even if they were significantly smaller. I knew how they moved, and I had seen it before, rolling over the surface, crushing everything in its path. Searching blindly in the dark with the pitter-patter stick of its tendrils. I could finally see it now. In the snowflakes licking my outstretched hand and landing on my face. They came falling from the sky. So tiny like that camera. I wouldn't have ever noticed it if it wasn't shown. I pulled my hand closer and watched as the tiny translucent tapeworms mixed with the snow. And began to stir in my skin. Cracking the icy shells uncurling their bodies as the heat from my arm woke them from their slumber. I could have brushed them off, but I already knew that it was too late. I looked up at the sky and watched them falling down like stars all around me. 
Nearly frozen, I stumbled my way back to the cabin. I flung open the door and shut it behind me. I had only closed my eyes for a second when I felt the glass a thump against my neck. I turned and came face to face with Guadalupe who stood on the other side of the window. She was smiling and her teeth were chattering. Let me in, she said as her hands banged on the glass again. Her sleeve and near tatters when I opened the door. She came in with the snow. Well, thank God, she told me as we pushed the door closed. I began rubbing her arms as if they were an icy blue. We have to get next to the fire, I told her. She nodded as we made our way up the stairs. Where did you go? What happened to Robert? I asked. He dragged me outside, she claimed. Pulled me by my hair and said something about not wanting to sleep under the same roof as a dang killer. I couldn't stop him. But then the wind and snow. Everything blowing so hard. I found a chance to push him when he was trying to throw me over an ice patch. He hit his head on a rock. And I would have just left him. But that guy kept pulling on my arms. Ripped my sleeves near off. She showed them to me and suddenly I felt frozen. Suddenly I felt as if I should have turned around the moment that I saw the roadblock on the mountain pass. So I stepped on his balls. Guadalupe kept saying. Felt one of them squish beneath my feet. I tell you that. Oh man, did he wail. I could even hear him above the wind. She kept rubbing her arms. We have to make it past this night, yeah. I'm sure they'll come for us in the morning. She stretched out her arms to welcome me close. What's wrong? Hey, where's Jill? I was still staring at the tattoo on her arm when I realized too quickly to look away. She was taken by the snow. What? She slept, and the wind carried her off. I couldn't get to her. You left her out there. I nodded as the light flickered on and off across our bodies, reading the tattoo on her arm over and over again in my head. Coexistence. I worked as a lifeguard for the local water park in San Antonio ever since I was 16. That didn't change when I went off to college. I would come home during the summer session and I would work there too. But then in 2020, the park didn't open. I went through an entire school year low on cash, splitting the meager stimulus checks over the coming months. And in 2021, the park was still closed. By now, I was desperate for a job and started looking through all of the listings that I could find. Indeed, a jobs, a Craigslist, a Facebook. But it wouldn't be until I bought the local gazette that I found my calling. It was in small print, requesting experience around bodies of water. Deep water. There was a phone number attached and not much else. I gave it a call and got an address. The old man on the line didn't seem too concerned with my credentials. He was more interested if I could make the hours. It would be every single day from 9am to 5. There ain't gonna be no sick days or nothing. No vacation, nothing. If you take on this job and you're 15 minutes late, I invited somebody to replace you. There will be no negotiations, no second chances, and absolutely no loitering. Once it's five, you pack it up and go home. Being broke, I couldn't get out of my motorcycle fast enough. I rode out to the sticks and found myself in miles and miles of farmland. There wasn't even a cow or an electric post in sight. I eventually arrived at a shed near the main road, and the old man was there to greet me. He was perhaps 60 years old, had on blue jean overalls and a white shirt, he also slung a shotgun over his shoulder. He didn't say much, just asked me to follow. At first, I kept looking back, afraid someone would steal my bike. But as we kept walking, I started to grow concerned for my own safety. Flashes of Old Yeller began to creep onto the back of my neck as I watched the barrel of his gun bob up and down as he walked. And then it dawned on me. I hadn't told a single person where I was going. Here's the hole, he suddenly said. 
I was so distracted that if he hadn't have said anything, I probably would have fallen into it. I looked down and realized that I had never seen water like this before. It was clear, but the bottom looked black. I could feel the sun banging on my shoulder, but still, the water looked black. And it wasn't really much of a hole, more like a small pond. It looked to be about 20 feet in length and there was nothing inside of it. No signs of wildlife or brushes. There was no algae or even leaves on top. Anyone who has owned even a small inflatable pool would have been baffled by the cleanliness of it. It looked clean enough to drink out of. Yet for some reason, I felt as if I drank this water, it would never stop. It would go down my mouth and into my stomach and just to keep going and going. I peered over the edge, trying to get a better look. The water started about a foot below the soil. The blades of grass were peeled away from it, and the surface was completely still. How deep is this thing? The old man shrugged. We're going to fill it up in a couple of weeks when the boys get the cat out here, but for now it's a liability issue. I've been sighted by those gosh dang leeches on the board saying that he needs at least eight man-hours of surveillance per day on top of all else. That's why you're here. He nodded toward the trail cameras set up in the trees. And I'll know if you don't show up, you hear. And with that, he was gone. And I was left to begin my first watch. In the first ten minutes, I came to the astounding conclusion that there was absolutely nothing to do. So I mostly sat down at a nearby tree and scrolled through my phone. At least there's connection out here. I said out loud to no one, and for no one. It wouldn't be two or three hours in before I grew tired of uh, looking at my phone, and I slightly dozed off. I had been sleeping for a while when I started feeling myself falling. I screamed in my dream as my legs kept kicking at the ground. I flapped my arms, but still I kept on falling. I could feel the rush of the void below as I kept sinking. And then I felt something wet, which instantly woke me up. I opened my eyes, facing the sky. I was on my back and my arms were above my shoulders, as if I had been dragged through the grass. I looked down at my feet and saw that they were in the water. I quickly got up and backed away. I looked behind me to where I had been sleeping under the tree, except for now I was about 15 feet from it. Must be a low point in the soil, I reasoned. That's why all the water had gathered here. This entire area must be dipped toward the hole. I'd have to be more careful in the future. A few hours later, the alarm on my watch would beep at 5 o'clock, and I would walk back to my motorcycle and go home. At dinner, I told my mom everything, where I was, who I was with, and the number that they could be reached at, and the address that I'd been given. I even told her about the hole, but she didn't seem to be too concerned. The sinkholes are common in this area, she told me. Oh, wetlands, erosion, she rattled off. For the next couple of days, I kept going back to the hole and admittedly, I fell asleep more than once, but I was always sure to not sleep too close to it again. It didn't take more than a week before sheer boredom and curiosity finally got the better of me and I started walking around the rim of the hole. I shined the flashlight from my phone into it. Mine didn't even get back a reflection. This thing had to be pretty deep, I figured. How deep was it, though? I found a broken branch nearby and dragged it over, poking it into the water. It had gone down about five or six feet when I realized that I was starting to feel some resistance. It felt as if it were near the bottom so I leaned more weight into it. Big mistake. The resistance gave and I fell in. I plunged through the surface. My body instantly started shaking. The water was freezing. It felt like a sledgehammer was taken to my chest as I convulsed. My arms stiffened at my sides. I couldn't swim. I couldn't swim. The muscles on my left leg contracted. I could feel the sinew rippling underneath my skin as it cramped up. It wouldn't extend in, so I began to sink. Everything was black. 
and I couldn't tell if I was right side up or not. I started to panic and tried to spit out the bit of water that had gotten into my mouth, but because I was completely submerged, it caused me to swallow. It felt as if I were choking. I wanted to cough, but I couldn't. I kicked with my free leg and it felt like white noise. I kicked again, nothing. This thing was bottomless. I would sink and keep sinking and no one would ever find me. I would just keep going and going until I was snaked through the earth's crust, eventually falling into the pits of magma far below. The pressure was beginning to build on every side of me, pushing in my eyes against my skin and wrapped around my throat, squeezing me flat, squeezing me of all my air so that it may open my mouth and force its way in. There was nothing I could do. My lungs felt as if they were on fire. A part of me wanted to be quenched, but then I remembered a part of my training manual as a lifeguard. Loosen your limbs, spread yourself out like a star, it read. I pushed against my joints and stretched out my limbs by force, kicking when I could. Slowly, slowly I felt myself rising toward the surface. A noise came from below. It shook everything around me. I laid absolutely still as I listened. It sounded as if a thousand needles were being dropped onto the floor, their points hitting the concrete. I looked down below, staring into the absolute darkness. Not a single sign. And yet I could feel something coming. And terrified, I began to claw my way to the surface. Swim, 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 I yelled at myself. I could hear the needles getting closer to my ear. Swim. I threw my arms upwards and kicked with both of my legs, fighting my cramped leg, struggling against the water, and still it felt as if I were sinking. The needles grew into a roar and I could feel an immense pressure building beneath me. The water felt like bubbles swimming past me as I was blown out of the water. I was hurled through the air and landed several feet away. It sounded like a jet engine behind me, absolutely screaming as the water shot straight into the sky. For a second, I thought I was dreaming. I walked over to it and saw the droplets in the air. It looked like rain falling upwards. I held on my arm and touched it. Even the viscosity was different than that of tap water. I felt something crawling on my skin which caused me to recoil. On my hand was a translucent and jelly-like creature the size of an eraser and completely flat. After I had exposed it to the air, it started to grow white. I watched as it contracted its body as it lunged toward, crawling on my arm. I peeled it off my skin and then threw it on the grass. It was so light, almost like air. And then it struck me. These things could be carried out for miles in the clouds. I've read about fish eggs and frogs that did that so who knows where these things might land. I looked up in time to see the water had mostly stopped. A few droplets had begun to fall back down as normal. I looked into the hole and it looked completely empty. I couldn't see the water below or anything else. The hole simply kept going. The ground started to shake and again, I could hear the sound of needles. I knew what was coming, so I ran as far as I could through the field. Three loud booms. The water shot upwards again and again like a cannon. I hadn't gotten very far when I saw the old man come driving down the field, his old sidestep pickup bouncing in the air as he came hurtling toward me. Get in the truck, I thought he yelled. Three more loud booms. I jump in through the window and he turns us around and drives us back toward the shed. When we get there, we are stopped by a group of men in suits. Black utility vehicles rumble past us, and the old man gets out and starts yelling at these men on his property. One of the suits pulls out a taser and the old man is shot in the chest. He goes down next to me. I try to pick him up, but the man in his suit yells at me to leave him. I'm up against the wall. Another man in black shouts at me. I feel my head being pushed against the shed. They cuff me and throw me into the back of their SUV. We're hurtling down the road, and in the rearview mirror I can still see the water shooting towards the sky, touching the clouds. 
I can still hear it launching into the air. I am taken to a secluded government building not too far away. I sit in a holding cell for about an hour when a man in a three-piece corduroy suit comes in. He explains to me that I had been tampering with a protected site on federal property. I try to protest, but he insists that it is within my best interest to not say a thing, to only listen. So, for the next hour, I listen to his explanation about phreatic volcanism, where water and magma interact. After I nod and agree a dozen more times, he tells me that I'm free to go. The next day, I see it on the news about a freak geyser that happened here in San Antonio. I click through the videos hoping someone else had witnessed what I had witnessed. But all I see are a bunch of videos of water spouting 10 or 12 feet into the air. It's nothing like what I saw. I figured I would squash this into the back of my mind, and I did for nearly a year. Until I heard about that girl, the one that gets stuck in the wood cabin, and I realized that I have to tell someone in case it happens to them too. I feel better now that it's all out in the open. Thanks. I tried to go to sleep, but Irene's dead eyes kept staring back at me. The light from the fire danced across her broken gaze. I wondered if she was awake when the killer had slit her throat. Did she burn their image into her brain as she died? Guadalupe must have noticed too because she placed her hands over the dead woman's eyes and closed them. If we had some half dollars, then she could rest. What? I asked numbly. Uh, coins on her eyelids for the fairy, Guadalupe said. So that she can pay the fare otherwise, she won't be able to rest. I nodded sleepily, the warmth from the fire baking my bones for they still remembered how cold I had been. Don't fall asleep. Marcus's voice came in my head. I looked across at Guadalupe as she was stoking the fire. She has a weapon. There is a weapon in her hands. Panic rose in my chest as my eyes darted around for a nearby object to arm myself with. My hands wrapped around a snow globe that had been on the table side. The weight felt good in my hands. The panic in my chest subsided, returning back to normal, beating warmly again as fatigue rolled over my body. I don't know when I had fallen asleep, but I forced my eyes open as I felt the first rays of the morning sun coming through the windows. Irene was staring directly at me. We had bonded her up and placed her into a corner. Both of us were too tired last night to move her any further. The light was low and when I looked outside, it was still snowing. How many millions of snowflakes in an hour? How many of them were not snowflakes? I looked over at Guadalupe who was resting against the couch. The mark on her face from where Robert had struck her had begun to bruise on her cheek. If she were the killer, I slowly got up. I don't know what I would do. I limped to the bathroom and I closed the door. In front of the mirror, I pulled down my pants to look at my wound. The bandage was caked with dry blood. The thick, yellowish green pus smelled rancid as I pulled back the pad. The adhesive on the edges pulled my skin along with it, causing the crusted wound to crack. I couldn't bear running water over it right now, so I cleaned it up as best I could and then opened a packet of antibiotic equipment and applied it gingerly to the area. I placed a new pad on it and then finally exhaled. I hadn't even noticed that I was holding my breath. When I had gathered myself, I limped back outside. Guadalupe was already in the kitchen. I looked at her for the first time in good lighting. Her skin had lost most of its color. The creases on her face were deeper than before, and her right eye could barely open. We were two battered women. Bread? In her hand was a fresh slice. She looked up from the kitchen. The power is still surging. Can't get it to stay on for more than a few seconds. Perhaps we should plug our phones into the wall and let them get as much charge as we can. I nodded. Yeah, in case the trooper doesn't come back today. I went over to the corner where my charger had been and I turned off my phone. 
and then I plugged it in. I was about to walk away when it started turning on by itself again. The logo brandished itself on the screen as it booted back up. I waited until I was at the home screen before pressing the power shutoff buttons in unison. The screen went black again and the charging indicator had come on. It was a good thing that I had kept watching it, as the charging indicator disappeared, and then a few moments later, the logo came back on again. It's the power surge, Guadalupe said. I don't know when she had come behind me. I didn't even hear her footsteps. The phone loses power and the charging indicator goes away, and then when the power comes back on, it automatically boots back up. Crappy design if you ask me. I left my phone on and watched as the screen lit up and the phone vibrated. Less than a second later, it vibrates again. At this rate, the battery will be drained. Guadalupe agreed. We're going to have to keep our phones off. It's nearly nightfall and we've taken turns at trying to get a signal. The trooper hasn't come and there's not a snowplow in sight. The snow hasn't stopped and it keeps piling higher outside. It's my turn to check my messages and attempt a call to the outside. I can't get anything, so I guess I'll have to wait. Another day has passed and another morning gone by. There's food and water and not much else. Neither of us had said a word in quite some time. My phone is at 32%. I tried calling out again, but still nothing. Night has fallen. I woke up to the embers dying in the fireplace. I think that's the sound of wood splintering in the hearth that had woken me up. The thought alone sent shivers down my arms. I brush away at them as I lay on the sectional. I pull my blankets closer as I squeeze my eyes shut. And then I hear it again. I open my eyes slowly and strain my ears. It sounds like a jingle. I slowly crawl off the couch and walk quietly to the stairs. I look down into the darkness. I don't see anything. I could start to see wisps as I breathed. The embers cracked in the fireplace and I started to go down the stairs slowly. The cool, stiff boards are creaking as they flexed beneath my weight. My legs are numb as I reach the bottom. I blindly put my hands forward and feel my way into the dark pressing my fingerprints against the night. I feel along the walls as I go down the hallway, my hands finding the door that leads into the garage. I open it and let it shut behind me. I pull on my phone and shine it into the empty spaces. Searching for the light, I finally find the switch and I flick it on. There's nothing at first, but then the lights flicker on, and then they turn off again. I hear the jingle. The light from my phone pans towards the noise, but it's too weak and the beam doesn't go half a foot. The lights in the corner flicker back on again. I get a glimpse of the door and I can see the wreath shaking, the balls and the little golden bells rolling back and forth as it touches the edges. The power goes out again. I walk closer with my phone, shining it onto the edges of the door frame, and I want to cry as I see that the door frame is wiggling. The worms. They look like hundreds of tiny little fingers squirming as they're trying to force their way out of the cracks, coming from the edges and beneath the door, pushing over each other as they try to get free. And then suddenly they stop. The jingling stops and the door stops shaking as they turn towards me. Their tiny blind faces are following me as I backed up into a support beam. Don't move. I nod my head and watch as their tips twitch along ever so slightly. The light turns back on. They can sense heat. I hear Guadalupe say from behind me. It looks like they're trying to break out. She walks closer to the door and pulls a needle from her sleeve. I hear the door jingle as the lock comes free. The worms have followed her feet, crawling over her shoes like snow as she looks into the room. Inside is a padded cell. The DIA must have been using this as a holding room. I can see a body. 
A heap of flesh balled into a mound in the center of the floor. It was the trooper. I guess he didn't make it past the gestation period. You killed him? Of course she killed him. Marcus screamed into my head. We needed a new host. We... Guadalupe turned to me and proceeds to unhinge her jaw, exposing the ridges in her throat and there in the center of her mouth is a pale pink larva looking creature in place of her tongue. I watched as its eyelids sickly open, revealing two beady eyes staring back at me. I can't even scream as I run towards the door. She crashes her body into mine and we tumble to the floor. I can feel my stitches opening up. Get off of me, I screamed. We need more hosts. Her voice echoes back as she lashes out and strikes me on the face. Lights pop in my head as I come reeling forward. She pins me to the ground. I can see from her hand that she's holding up one of the translucent worms from the door. The edges are growing white as if it is dying. She rips off the whitening flesh and I watch as they slowly start to grow back. Usually, we only need an opening, even a wound will work, but if we want it to really stick, through the mouth is the fastest option. What are you doing? Good, stall her. Oh, don't worry, it won't hurt much. We simply eat your tongue away until the ends and then attach ourselves to the muscle. She dangles it playfully above my mouth. Stall her. What are you? I cried. Her lips unfurl as she smiles. None of us really know. One day, my brothers and sisters just were. Some say we came from the sky. Others say deep from the ocean. All I know is that we want to coexist alongside humans. You're a parasite. I spat as I struggled underneath her. But the points of her knees are pressed against my shoulder and ribcage. You won't think that once you become like us. Now shut up and open wide. All I can do is shake my head as she brings the thing closer to my face. Keep her talking. You killed Irene, didn't you? She was too old to be a host. We tried and she died. Oh god, Robert was right. We had to slit her throat to make it seem less suspicious. She nodded in agreement. I tried pushing my shoulder off the floor but her knee pushed me down once again. But you're young and healthy. You'll make a good host. Maybe even become a queen. Her hand chokes my neck. I gag from the forest, my mouth opening as she starts to lower the creature in. I close my eyes, expecting to feel it ooze down my throat. But she pauses. I look up and see her staring curiously into my mouth. Brother? She peers closer. But you're nearly dead. She reaches down my throat and starts pulling at my tongue. Her hand recoils as she howls. Now! I push her off and run towards the door. I slam it behind me and lock it. Kill her! I run up the stairs and start pulling open the drawers. I can hear the door to the garage shaking as it is struck repeatedly. I'm looking for a weapon as the sounds of wood breaking come from below. It's pitch black as the fire has died out in the hearth. I can hear her running up the stairs. I turn to escape out the balcony but my head is suddenly pulled back. I push against her so fiercely that a chunk of my hair comes off in her hands. My hands search blindly in the dark, looking for something to use. My fingers wrap around a wrought iron poker. I swing it wildly in every direction. I feel the curved end connect with a sickening crunch as it lodges into the side of Guadalupe's head. She screams and keeps coming, clawing at my arms, pulling herself closer to my mouth. I yank the rod loose and a chunk of her head comes off. There's blood everywhere. She moves towards me again, her hands outstretched as she tumbles to the floor. I pull my arm back and I strike down again and again and again. And when I see that pink thing wriggling its way out of her mouth, I flatten it with the steel in my hands. I can hear the exoskeleton crunch. Day broke out into the living room. 
Irene's eyes were still open as she stared at us. I gathered a few things from the rooms. Socks from Robert's bag, some clothes out of Jill's suitcase, and even some garments from Guadalupe's room. I packed some food and rope in my bag. The snow had stopped sometime in the night and the sun had come out, but I still couldn't get a clear signal. Before I left, I turned in the stove without lighting it, letting the gas fill the house, and then placed a flickering candle in one of the rooms downstairs. I pushed my way through the front door and began walking back towards the hospital. The ice blanketed everything. I didn't know if I could make it, but a voice in my head kept telling me that I could. Sometime later, I hear an explosion in the distance. The fire was probably raging right now back at the cabin. I pulled my jacket closer. I kept walking, leaving most parts of the main road as I cut across the mountain. Each step was knee-deep and difficult for me to clear. I could feel blood dripping down my leg, but eventually, I came to the top of an adjacent mountain range, just as the sun had begun to dip. I looked down at the alcove and saw the hospital, and a few surrounding businesses at Mercy. I told you that I get it. I hear his voice faintly in my head, and then I felt something rigid in my mouth. It was dried and it felt solid. I took off Guadalupe's gloves and reached into my throat, nearly choking as my fingers searched for the foreign object. When my fingers touched it, I immediately knew what it was. I pulled it out from the back of my tongue and revealed what looked like half a cocoon. I noticed that the exoskeleton was peeling so I began to shed away the layers. Inside was half of a translucent worm, its body covered in slight yellow pus as the edges began to grow white. It seemed to turn and look at me before it finally stopped moving. I placed it gently on the snow and cried. Ever since then, I haven't been able to hear Marcus's voice. I wish that I could have thanked him. I wish he could have known how much I loved him. No matter what. Thank you all for making it to the end of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed the stories as much as I enjoy reading them. I would also like to give a final thank you to today's sponsor, Masterworks. Start building a diversified art portfolio at masterworks.art slash mrcreeps. It's really starting to heat up outside, at least in my hemisphere. I hope you're able to soak up some sun and enjoy the start of summer. It's definitely one of my favorite times of the year. Have an amazing morning, day, or night, wherever you may be in the world, and as always, stay creepy.